So when you're ready, Gosh. there are now. There we go. We're on air. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the September 14th. September 14th meeting of the Planning Policy Commission. We're going to have a double um, public hearing tonight on two important recommendations from the city on where our future is going to be. Uh, but first, we have a since we have a quorum, we need a um, we need to approve the minutes. Do I have a? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. So we're going to do it individually. So approve the minutes of, of August 24th. Is that what you're going to? OK. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Um, I need a motion to approve the minutes for August 31st. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any, any errors, changes? OK. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? So with that, we will go right into Jen uh, and her uh, presentation on vertical mixed use, use, vertical mixed use in Central Issaquah. Hi, good evening. My name is Jen Davis Hayes, and I work um, in the Economic Development Department uh, here at the city as an Economic Development Manager. And I just wanted to make one note: this is not the public hearing tonight. We actually will be back to PPC on the 28th, so in two weeks to hold the public hearing. So tonight's really more of a discussion point, and then we will come back with the code language and um, other and the final recommendations. Okay, but there is going to be public, of course, questions, answers, sure. comments. So okay. okay. Okay, great. So um, men, some of you may know that the vertical mixed use is one of the six items that was asked by uh, council to look at for the development moratorium. But this project has actually started before the moratorium started in September. Um, back in um, March or April of 2016, council, uh, after looking at what's ha what the development that was happening in the central Issaquah area, wasn't seeing the types of projects um, that, that you see in this, that are represented in the Central Issaquah Plan vision. Um, a lot of times we were seeing single story uh, developments and instead of maybe being, and they had a lot of surface parking lot, but they had the building to the front of the, to the, of the property, which is what we wanted, but it was still not achieving the density or the, or the be, a better land use that we wanted to see. Um, we also saw residential uh, developments happening, but again, without the commercial ground floor um, being available. So the council asked us to look at the, um, why that was not happening in the market, and that's kind of started the journey. So we um, have gone through that, and I tonight we'll go through quickly what those findings are, and then the next stage of uh, the of looking at what we can do to ensure that um, when development happens, that the the form of the buildings will be built in order to ensure um, the vibrancy that we expect to see in, in Central Issaquah. So, any questions before I start about that? Okay. So in general, this is where we're at uh, as far as the recommendations t regarding the moratorium. Um, so we were at the full uh, council for the work session in August, and we presented the recommendations from um, Crandall Rambula, who's a consultant firm we hired to look at, again, the regulation, uh, what types of regulations need to be in place to ensure we get what we want. We uh, were at Land and Shore last week. We're here this week. We'll be here in two weeks again with the public hearing, and then back to Land and Shore and final council. And uh, again, this is part of the moratorium, so we, the, uh, this is on the schedule for what, uh, what we had planned out, at least readjusted planned out. So, And so tonight we're gonna talk again, and we're gonna provide you some information about what the, regu the recommendations are and get any feedback you have about that. The recommendations are not co written in code yet, but we are uh, real close to getting there. So the uh, first slide has a lot of words, but um, basically, as I mentioned, the council first asked us, why aren't we getting what we want in this market? And so we hired um, the firm called Eco Northwest, and they are a data analysis firm. They uh, created a financial model to look at, um, they inputted our information about our current development regulations. They looked at the market, about what costs were there to build, what rents people were getting in the commercial and the 
residential markets and looked at that and this these are the findings from that and we also I should also mention we also um, interviewed other cities to find out um, how they uh, proceeded with getting vertical mixed use and a more vibrant community and we also um, touched base, base with some developers once we had some of that data to see if it was uh, ringing true to that so in general um, basically vertical mixed use fe feasibility is challenging because of there's a uh, uh, uncertainty. So again, as I just mentioned, none of this building type has been built to this point. So being the pioneer, the first one is always more risky. And if the market doesn't feel like there's a market there, it, it's hesitant to, to do that. Um, the cost the cost to build something where you have two different, basically, users and two different needs um, is not just one straight up you know, apartment off over apartment. You have commercial space that has some different um, infrastructure needs and also leasing environment. Make it, again, something that if you're not in that if the market isn't proven already, it's a challenge to move forward. Um, but but the market dynamics are moving in the right direction. And so they estimated between five and 10 years that it would actually um, come to the point where it, the market is here to build that automatically without having any incentives or um, uh, involvement with the city. And um, so one of the things they did mention when they did the analysis is that when we look at it, when we want to see a vertical mixed use building with potentially residential above or office maybe and the ground floor retail, really it's, you're looking at the, at the residential when you're looking at what the, what the rents and, and everything are because the amount of ground floor retail that's on the bottom is, is much smaller. And so again, a lot of it was relying on what the current residential market was getting for uh, market rates. Um, and then they said, they you know looked at again what other cities have done. Um, and so uh, property tax exemption, either through multifamily tax exemption, that's okay, um, or fee waivers, um, or uh, some density bonus calibration with ARP density bonus, uh, they discovered that actually it was a disincentive because in order to go up higher, it actually costs more to get those extra floors and it didn't way out and what you would receive in, in rental. So um, they had some some ideas on um, on ways that if the, if, the, if the city wanted to influence the market and encourage that to happen, those are some of the things that could that they could do. I'm going to stop now and uh, and you had uh, you did have the presentation that the Eco Northwest presented to the city council uh, last September um, on lots of data slides. Um, I didn't want to go through all of those because it is it could take another that could take an hour just itself, but just a high, at a high level to help you understand where we've been. But if you have any questions about the again the high level of where this at this is at that led us to where we're going, um, please let me know. So okay. um, I have some questions. Um, I understand that this is where the city wants to go in the way of high rise and, and uh, very similar to some of the other cities that have developed some nice um, family oriented developments mm -hmm. in the city. I know that's what we're going to looking at, but when you look at um, Kirkland, they already have a base. They already have things. They have uh, bigger buildings. They have the waterfront. They have all of this going on. And so there's, they're drawing people in to fill up these buildings. And one of the things that you said it would be market driven. Well, we're not going to be market driven unless we have something that people want to come here for. And so although the analysis is great, but it doesn't look at that side. What, what is the city doing to brand us as a uh, recreation center or those kinds of things where you're going to get maybe younger people to come in, fill up those, and enjoy the, the retail? What is actually going on in that? Because it's the way I look at it, it's two phases. Sure. 
So, so I won't get too into detail, but we are actually um, preparing an RFP right now for because the city council did um, provide some money for branding for the community um, this year, and LTAC, our lodging tax advisory council, um, also matched that money, and so that will begin um, in the fourth quarter as far as doing um, getting a consultant on board and um, starting the process. So that um, that broader point of if it's recreational branding, which we, you know we all kind of th think that's our strength. Um, that that is happening. I think there's other things that they did see that people like because, again, the recreation opportunities. Also, the school district, as we know, is a really strong school district. Um, that was another strength that people are currently co uh, coming here for. And so, and we are, you know, we're growing. Um, uh, in the it's the ages that are people are that are moving into Issaquah, so it's not just um, families themselves, but you know at Atlas, the new apartment building, um, we're seeing some younger um, uh, residents. So oh, I, I I hear you five to ten years from now, and I'm concerned that mm -hmm. things are going to be built not to the specifications that that you are looking at. And we're stuck. We so, won't get that. Right. So you, that's a very good transition point because, because the, so the council really t was torn with this because um, they, again, we all believe in this community. We believe that we, that the vision of the Central Squaw Plan that's laid out is um, a really great vision, um, but they don't want to lose the opportunity. And I think that, again, that's one of the, was one of the points of this study is that when things get built, they're there for 50 years, right? And so what, uh, what can we do to ensure it doesn't? So the, so our next consultant looked at, okay, what are the things we need to do if we want to, if we want to ensure that the building forms get built in the right way? A question? Go ahead. Well, I'm not sure how we're going to run this because it's sort of just free for all. Yeah, it's a free for all. <laughs> I'm curious about how the concept of 90% parking okay. is going to work with retail on the ground floor and housing above it. Where's this parking going to go? Okay. It can't go down at least in Issaquah. So if retail's on the ground floor, then mm -hmm. is parking the next two or three floors up and then there's apartments, or is it on the roof or in a separate building a block away, or what, what's the concept? It seems to me you're trying to put everything into something that's not going to happen. Okay. So Carl, do you mind if I go through the recommendations and then answer that when we get to the parking? Because um, I don't, we haven't mentioned about parking yet. Because we, I will definitely, I will definitely address how we got to that um, analysis for for that number. Is that okay? Sure. Just because right now the audience doesn't know, you know, people haven't heard about that yet. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. We, we stopped so, so, when you first started talking about mixed use. So. Okay. <clears throat> I'm looking at mixed use on a ground floor. Yeah. And I guess apartments above it. Is that what the concept that, is? Um, or, or office, yes. So mixed multiple uses, yes. Okay. Yes. And the idea with um, the ground floor commercial is to have this a vibrant you know, event. Well, I understand yeah. what that concept okay. is. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how you're going to get people there. And yeah. that goes to the parking, which we're going to talk about later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I will then jump to, so um, so the council really did struggle with um, seeing this data and how do we, what do we do to, again to make sure that um, we don't lose the opportunity. And so um, the consulting firm Crandall Rambula, who's already working on the architectural and urban design manuals, I believe you may have seen, um, we, we hired them to look at and to do the analysis of what, um, looking at what our code currently is and what, um, if we want to ensure that we get this vibrance uh, Density in our urban center. How do we get that? And so the the four things here that they recommended are to require ground floor commercial frontages in specific areas, and we'll look at that, and we'll look at each of these in more detail. Um, changing the base um, height, and set, um, and then increasing the FAR and decreasing uh, the percentage of surface parking or increasing surface or um, structured parking. So. Um, one of the things that uh, they mentioned is that so the the 
all the pieces that go into making a, a, um, a building form that, that allows for that vibrancy are not just gonna be addressed by those four things, but there are things that they've uh, included in the architectural and urban design manual that will address also the, verb the vertical mixed use building. So don't feel like, well, what about, you know, like for instance, you know, building edges and, and um, setbacks and et cetera. Like, what about those things? Because those are important as well, especially as uh, you know, you've all been in a in a vibrant center where you just it just feels right, and you've been in other places where you just don't feel like people want to be. And so, they just we just want to remind you that a lot of the things are being addressed that will help uh, create what we want that's already in the in the design manuals. Um, so first, our first thing was where, um, because as you know, Central Issaquah is a really large area, and um, we, we first focused on the urban core, because that's where the highest density is, and that's where we have a lot of our amenities, where we have um, services, we have p parks and rec, and we have the ability to um, to build, build the most dense in the Central Issaquah area, as well as we know when light rail comes, this is about around where the area will be. What the concept that um, Crandall Rambley looked at is, and so um, Northwest Mall on the left side of the screen, that exists currently, and in our planning documents for the Central Sequoia Plan, um, there's an extension that goes, and this may not be exactly where it goes, but it pretty much goes over and hits into 7th. Um, and they saw that as an opportunity to create, and I think in the Central Sequoia Plan it also mentioned, is an opportunity to create something along that where it's more pedestrian friendly um, and you're able to create a, a walking uh, retail area. And uh, the, the green areas are looking at, you know, where the current wetlands are and a where a potential plaza could go. And again, this is very high level kind of thinking, what, what, where are we looking at? These, these two areas are in the um, Gilman and the Tibbetts Valley districts of the Central Squat area. And um, we see the opportunities for the redevelopment in these areas um, as key to our uh, Central Issaquah plan. Quick question. So yeah. on the intersection of Newport Way and Maple Street, I was in a conversation, I don't remember with who, but the portion that says wetland, mm -hmm. they were talking about actually rezoning that for building. So is that wetland area, is that gonna be a permanent wetland? Or is that possibly going to be transitioned to a building site? Our plan is not to transition it into a building site. No. Okay. Um, so again, so then the concept would be that, so the black lines are where we would require ground floor commercial space to be built, okay? So the buildings themselves would be larger in these larger areas. But between, um, so we're looking at three different property owners, so between Gilman and the end of where the Sports Authority, soon to be Hobby Lobby building is, on um, 12th on the eastern side, the western side has a development agreement, so we can't put any regulations on there because they already have um, an agreement. And then on the north side of what they're looking at as mall, and so the green that goes along mall, there's the white, which is the street, and then the green. Um, the concept is to do like a promenade, to have like a linear park and have, a, again, a wider area where people feel like they can walk and have um, the ability to, to enjoy the area without cars whizzing by it at 40 to 50 miles per hour. And then also between, on Maple Street Northwest, between uh, Mall and Gilman. One of the things that uh, Crandall Arambula did uh, talk to us about is that vertical mixed use um, is, is most successful where you have between five and 15,000 trips a day, trips a day passing by. So for instance, Gilman I think is closer to 27-ish or so, um, because you really need the ability to be, put, you know, have that in front parking and have people who are on the sidewalk at a cafe or wanting to stroll not feel like they're you know, in danger by cars whizzing by. So w when we looked at these streets and the potential streets, that's what uh, that, it met that, that um, criteria. Any questions about the, the general area we're looking at? And, and again, um, the, the reason, the, the, a couple of the other criteria we looked at is again, the, the connection to the amenities that already exist. So we already have, again, transit center, um, services, jobs. We have a, quite a few number of office buildings in here that have pr um, professional jobs that are available to people. Um, and again, the potential for growth. 
So the Rowley area has a development agreement, yes, right? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anything that's over near the park and ride isn't potentially an option? Yeah, so basically um, from 12th to the, to the west, Northwest Maple to Northwest Gilman, that um, those that block area, I would say probably 80% of that is Raleigh. There's some of those properties not in, and then on the other side of um, SR 900, they have a big swath. And if you mm -hmm. look at zoning maps ever, you'll see like the coral color that is the urban core color of zoning within those that blocks I just mentioned that you know would be the property that uh, is somebody owned by somebody else besides Raleigh. Okay. Is 12th Street? Being removed? No, it's there. Maybe it's just hard to see. So it's right here. <coughs> this one? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So what in, in the rally agreement, do you know what they can build in there? If they they could build something very similar to what we're, we're proposing okay. as far as vertical mixed use, yes. Okay. Um, so they're, they're, I mean, their concepts are very, I think, similar to what's in the central Squaw plan as far as density and types of building types. So, Do we have a sense that that will happen either before the market is going to dictate this type of development or longer term? The Raleigh or this, I'm sorry. Raleigh. Um, you know, they have focused on what's called Hyla neighborhood or district, which is on the other side of SR 900. So that's where they built the, the hotels and mm -hmm. office. So um, depending on, you know, how quickly, but I don't ant anticipate in the next five to 10 years seeing something redeveloped here, but that could change. I'm not, I don't want to speak for them. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to mention this. So the street grid here that's outlined, again, is just for uh, high-level planning um, to kind of figure out uh, how things could fit within here. And um, again, we know that there are wetlands that are within the uh, town and country and common shopping center areas. And so Ron mentioned, you know, that big parcel is actually, that is not green here on this one, but that's actually part of the commons shopping center Part, property, so, um, and we we want to make sure that we, uh, when this does get redeveloped, that we ensure that uh, take advantage of those opportunities of those green amenities and create more of amenity versus just a place over there that's around something else. So, um, the actual all these green little parks and everything are not exactly what you'll see. Um, in the redevelopment. We really wanted to, um, for the commons area, for instance, um, right now the Central Issaquah plan talks about that the exact road, um, actually for both of these, the exact road uh, placement will be de determined when redevelopment occurs. And we have had one meeting with the commons ownership uh, about an interest in looking at that future potential for them where it would be better defined. So we, um, we basically are recommending to implement, again, the vertical mix requirement, use requirements, which we're gonna be talking about next along in that area. Are there any concerns with that? I just have a clarification yeah. question on the last um, slide. So what, what do you um, propose as far as or improving or adding amenities to the wetlands areas? So there's nothing proposed right now, but we wanna make sure we call that out to ensure that uh, when it does get when it does get into the point of redevelopment, either through a development agreement or some other way that it's not forgotten about. Okay, so amenities such as like a walkway or? Yeah, yeah we haven't gotten to those details now. Okay. Now ours is, our, our focus has really been more building type, right? And so again, the street, the street um, grids aren't part of our recommendation. Um, but again, we don't want to lose the, the, the ideas that were developed during this time. Okay. But there hasn't been research you know, into exactly did these things make sense. So, um, so we talked about where, um, and then now what? <laughs> um, so when you think about vertical, when you think about commercial fl on the ground floor, um, again, all of you have been into very vibrant areas. Um, what you think about typically are food and beverage and retail services, right? Uh, the consultants believe that, you know, if we're gonna create a vertical mixed use area, that that's important that we specify those uses only allowed in these areas. Um, we have, have uh, again, through the analysis we've had done previously, 
recognize in our inter interviews with other cities, I recognize that uh, that may not be, we're not maybe not there yet for the market. And so what we decided to recommend instead was to um, allow all the uses that are allowed in urban core currently, minus the outdoor storage and drive through type of things that don't really uh, make sense for a, ver a vertical mixed use building, but require those types of the food and service, the food and beverage rather, and the retail service to be within 60 feet of the corner. So from the corner to 60 feet of the building to 60 feet in has to, has to have that type of use. Does that make sense? And we got these figures from currently the, in the, um, I think it's like for the building activity for the street walls are, re are required to ensure that there's activity within the first 60 feet of the corner from the building. So we took that from what's already existing in the Central Issaquah plan. And the reason why we did that is that we didn't want um, the other uses, so outside of the retail and service and restaurants, such as art galleries, a drug store, schools, the, they would not be allowed then in, our, in a commercial area on the ground floor. And so we, it, it, we thought it was too restrictive um, of just saying only food and beverage and retail services. Um, we also looked at what Redmond, Kirkland, other cities are doing, and none of them are that strict. Um, Kirkland does, in a very small area, and they're established downtown, as you mentioned, um, require uh, more specific uses, but that's, uh, again, in a very small area, and then beyond, like one block away, they, they allow more office and other well, art galleries, et cetera. And then, um, you know, one of the things, uh, again, this is gonna be something we want, we want to see happen and we wanna make sure it's successful. We do not wanna see a building built and have um, vacant storefront for very long because they can't find their restaurant or that retail service to uh, go there. And it was, you know, as we know, retail services are changing in this world. And so to be so restrictive, we thought was not a good idea. So can I ask you yes. a question? So, so we paid consultants to, to do the analysis. I'm, I'm concerned that we're overriding without, without providing a justification as to why they recommended that and, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, yeah, they said that, so that's, I mean, we're paying them to, to make recommendations. Right. Yeah, so, you know, that's true. We also paid Eco Northwest to make recommendations and they didn't, they showed something different. So um, I think that the, the consultants, the Crandall Rambler consultants, were, we um, were looking around the building type and form and the use was, a, like, was not a primary focus. They didn't do any analysis as far as our market. I think they, they believed in our strong market and they believe that that's a possibility, but they didn't have any, when I asked them, like, where did you, you know, is there a study you're looking at or is there something that you can show that actually um, would justify this? And again, they just felt that this was something that could be possible for an 18 hour day kind of use. And I think we, again, being in our community, talking to other communities in the area and seeing how they have grown because not all the cities you see now that are vibrant started that way. There's a transition time. And so, um, and even currently, again, in, in Redmond, they do not restrict it so so tightly um, along Cleveland Street where they do require mixed use. So um, that was the reason for us to change the, the um, recommendation a bit. Do you have a follow-up question or comment? And uh, you know this this the trend of this conversation really concerns me okay. because you know we we pay we pay a lot of money to consultants to to give us recommendations and right. if if they're not doing a good job then we need to replace them or they're not giving us what we need we need to replace them sure. we don't pay that pay for what for for recommendations that we're not using uh, so so I don't understand I don't I don't understand the override. Uh, okay. You know, there has to be a justification of why there's an override and, you know, just the staff saying, you know, we don't think that this is going to work, it, it seems really concerning to me. So the, again, the consultants, these consultants were hired to do more of a building development um, <laughs> recommendations and then they su suggested this as far as the uses. So that wasn't, the use wasn't part of their original um, scope. Um, and. Uh, and that, you know, again, we had another consultant that, that provided some additional information, and we used that knowledge to to develop our our uh, recommendations. So, I mean, we think we, we think they're strong consultants, and they gave us really good um, other recommendations. This one we just thought would we understand our community a, their, um, a little better and have some other data that they didn't take into account. 
Could you re please recap again? Yes. The, the, the two different stories. The, the original vision that you have, the intention for the mixed use with the retail or mixed use uh, and what that picture would look like, what you aspirationally would like to see, and then what is it that you think would be reality and would the reality eventually change into your aspirational vision or is it, are we actually building to what we think is a reality? Because if we built to reality, there might be walls, obstruction, uh, things that would obstruct a, um, would not necessarily come out as a, maybe appropriate for retail space, right? There might be walls, concrete walls as opposed to glass walls. Yeah, and so uh, that's a great uh, point, Ron. So when we look, when we're looking at these re re uh, requirements and recommendations, it's a very, again, it's a very small, you know, four things. The Central Issaquah plan already accounts for that, where the, the transparency on the ground floor for commercial is already addressed. And I'm not a planner, so I can't t quote it at the top of my head, but it's, you know, 60% or, you know, whatever percent. So those things they didn't need to touch because they're already in the code. Um, and then, again, the urban, the uh, architectural and urban design manual are addressing all those same things. So so we don't need for, for this project to looking at a building. So we're really looking at this building that we're going to build, what it's important to have the, and in this building in order to, to make it successful to be vertical mixed use and what, or what are the requirements that will ensure it will be as opposed to you could build a one-story building or you can build a three-story building. What you're saying is that we're going to future-proof the development of what actually in lands in there in its beginning stages may not be what we see in our vision, but it will eventually long-term. The actual uses? Yes. yes, that would be, that's our definitely goal. And I think, again, um, other cities have seen that transition where, you know, businesses come in and um, as, as more neighborhood, you think about the number of residents that live in the central Issaquah area right now, especially urban core, I think it's 700, what, well, seven, core zero. zero. Yeah, okay, that's right. So it's 750 units, is it, within central Issaquah? So, so when we're talking about these spaces, we're talking about neighborhood serving space. It doesn't mean that people won't come from other areas, but there's not a neighborhood yet, there yet. So for somebody to build a restaurant that needs date, you know, lunchtime and dinner traffic and maybe even breakfast, it's, <laughs> it's a, you know, I think it's a little before time. Now, does not mean that something could go there today and not be successful, but um, we want to make sure that we provide the, the, the breadth of choices without getting too far flung uh, of what we want to see there. So, but to have, again, to have that where an art gallery or drugstore couldn't come in if we only restricted it to the, um, to retail and um, uh, food service, that's, that's something we think would be a missed opportunity. And as planners, they would be sitting there saying, sorry, it's against our code to do that. And that's, I don't think, <laughs> right for a vibrant community. I hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Any other comments on this topic? Next is fun height and FAR. So um, when the consultants, the consultants did an analysis, Carl, when you're saying how did they get to this 90%, so they did an analysis of looking at um, what we can build currently under the um, Central Squaw Plan urban core area and what uh, they think is necessary. And so that's kind of how we got to these um, detailed recommendations. And um, what they discovered is that we can build, a, a developer could build something very auto-centric, right? Um, because of our minute lower, lower FARs and our low um, requirements. Um, so what they are recommending is that we want to um, require that the ground floor that is built for the commercial use is between 50 and 20 feet. So currently it's um, 15 f feet on our pedestrian uh, ways. I don't know if that's the exact core streets. Okay. Um, and so we, we want to give a little bit more more height because a lot of times, and if you if you may notice in some of the newer buildings, that commercial space needs that more that higher ceiling. So we wanted to raise that up. Um, but we wanted to look at, instead of saying, um, okay, uh, now you can you can go up to 48 feet uh, as your base. Um, we wanted the analysis shows that you really need to have six stories in order to make this work. And so six stories turns out to be about 85 feet. Um, and then with a the bonus density, you can do up to 10 store floors, um, which is 135 feet. Um, and so again, through their analysis, they did uh, you know running through numbers. Um, this 
is in line with other developments they've seen in, in vertical mixed use areas and in, in areas that we want to uh, see redeveloped. Um, and so it's the, 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 I guess I should define here. So the base for the height does not mean the minimum. It actually means the, hot, the maximum that you can do before you go into bonus density. So it's a little, f uh, so you, right now in the urban core, you can only build to 48 feet before you have to pay into um, density, density bonus. And our first consultant showed us that the density bonus was actually a disincentive, again, because of what it cost to, to get those extra floors didn't make up in revenue. So this, this changing this here allows it to align a bit better with what we want to see in the vertical mixed use areas. Isn't 12 stories being discussed? Um, where, I'm sorry? In the urban core? Well, so the maximum in the urban core is 125 currently. But again, we, we're asking like the first story. So, so the, the height isn't that different. So it's 135 versus 125. But we're, we want to make sure that when they do build the building, again, the first floor commercial has that height that's necessary and then give them the flexibility to do the height limits they need within that first floor and that sixth floor or, or the 10th floor if they're going to use bonus density. Okay. But you, so what you're saying is 135, 10 floors is maximum height. Yeah. And we're not talking about 12 stories. I thought I heard 12 stories in either in the land and shore or council. Mm -mm. No? Okay. Mm -mm. No. No. Uh, for reference, yes. how tall is Atlas? Oh, well, it's 48, 40, 50 it's ish, because 50, 50, 50, 53. Yeah, they're right in there. Because they have the, you know, again, the roof elements that aren't counted. And so 53 is what Keith said? Okay. Yeah. And again, this is already, you know, in the, in the urban core, the 125 is already allowed. So the only building we have in town that reaches 10 floors is Timber Ridge. Timber Ridge is 10 floors is what Keith said. We're already up on a hill. So. <laughs> they look even bigger then, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, uh, you know, we agree that, that that makes a lot of sense. And, and again, counting on their... Um, their knowledge of looking at doing the analysis. Again, they did the analysis for the building type, not for the uses um, necessary for a successful mi mixed use project. So, and this uh, is a quick slide from, you do have their presentation as well, it's a hundred slides. <laughs> so I didn't wanna take that much time with those. But this is a, the analysis they did a bit about. So this is the corner of uh, 12th and Gilman. So again, we're on the corner there is where currently Chase Bank is. Um, and so they did some running of numbers and, and seeing, okay, what could you actually fit here? And looking at, with parking, what could you actually do? And so they calculated that um, being able to go under uh, under the building for one level, having maybe some tuck-in, having a strip of parking in the back, because you need to have some of that space for deliveries and some other areas, and as well as having parking, uh, on-street parking in the front would meet its needs for the, the percentage parking required. We did, not, we did not change any of the parking requirements um, as far as uh, per use, but that's the analysis that they did. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I, I, I just, can you go back to that slide? Yeah, yeah. Where are all the cars that now go to Hobby Lobby? Where are they gonna park? So this is, a, all right, this is a plopping I mean, down. No, on no, a, let me yeah. finish. Okay. And we got a residential thing there. It looks like four stories, 20,000 square feet per floor. How many apartment buildings is it? How many apartment units? I don't have How many to, cars? So, so they did the that. analysis to make to meet the parking requirements that are in our code. So, making sure they have one, you know, parking per if it's per unit or depending on the size. So. Okay. So, so this is not to say that this it, whole. It'll never happen, but. Go ahead. So this is not uh, to say that this is exactly gonna happen like this. It was to look at what could happen because actually the Chase Bank, which is in the corner, is a different ownership than the town and country. So the town and country is not, you're right, town and country is not gonna build in front of their, their current store um, to take away the parking unless they build a structured parking garage on a different part of their property. They have a really large property and you know if, if, if they redevelop in phases, but 
But you're right, this, um, this is not to say this is what we think is gonna happen tomorrow. Um, we're, it was a test of seeing how things could fit and them doing the analysis of running through. Town and country is only, town and country could become that, what you're saying. Sure, yeah, yes. But I don't think anybody, th again, I don't think anybody's saying that, that this is exactly what will happen here. Well, that's only four I guess, stories. I guess my problem is I, it, when you show a picture like this and it, it, we're all subject to saying, well, that's what it's gonna look like. And that's not true because the first thing that could happen is they would level the Hobby Lobby and then that disappears right. and then there's no parking needed for the store right. that's not right. there. Right. So. But, but I guess I guess I bring in a little reality where they just are signing, they're just bringing in new business. I'm not sure that they would initially lobby, you know, demolish Hobby Lobby. But the, the concept of this could be plopped anywhere along the areas that we're looking at, right? So you could build one of these buildings, you could build two of these buildings, you could build three of the buildings. The idea for them is to show you what they we're looking at. And so again, we're not looking at, you know, really uh, skyscraper kind of buildings. This is the type of environment we want to, we, we want, we want to create for this vertical mixed use area. But in, in saying that, it's actually not, this wouldn't be built out to its maximum use. So if a developer came in and wanted to build this out to its maximum use, you would be looking at about how many units per parcel. You know, I don't know that. So we were focusing on the elements that were necessary so when they do build, um, what that could be. And I think there's probably analysis in the central so called plan already about what where they could build. You know, I'm not sure by parcel, but I'm not looking for you to have an answer, Kristen, but, but if that already exists. Because um, we didn't, again, we didn't pay the consultants to figure out you know, okay, what's the full extent? Because that's already, has already been done as part of the central as well plan effort. Um, so we didn't, again, pursue that path with them. We could actually have, I, I think the numbers are about 7,000 units for the urban core. Is so that shaking hands? That would be about 10 stories per unit, I mean, per parcel. Wouldn't look anything like that into, uh, Carl's point, parking, mm -hmm. I would assume that would probably 7,000 units, you figure maybe 1.2 cars per unit, you'd be looking at almost four floors per building of parking. So the 7,000 units though aren't gonna be just on these parcels and the urban core goes from basically um, Newport over, to, over the highway, across the highway into where Costco is and West from SR to west west of uh, SR 900 to the Commons, so that's it's a much larger area than you're envisioning seeing here in these few lots. So talk us through, because I think what we're having a hard time yeah. understanding is when you have a dense unit of residential that requires 90 percent mm -hmm. or mixed use with residential on top that requires 90 percent parking, and the first floor is retail commercial. How many floors of parking and like, how do you fit that in? Sure. So I'm gonna walk right in the mic for a second, but um, if you notice the red here, that's where they envision, you know, the retail would be. And so you notice it's not the full block. So they could have tuck-in parking here. Okay. As well as going under. Um, and if they needed to, they could have um, going up to a second level. But the idea is that the, um, in the, on the ground floor, you would not know that there's a parking garage behind that if that's how it was built. Okay, and so you would go under much like Atlas did mm -hmm. um, for the idea that you can go under for a floor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We feel like that one and a half under plus a little bit of street plus a little bit of surface. Very little surface. Yeah, that's not gonna There'll work. more than a floor of parking. Atlas, if I'm not mistaken, had half parking underground and half surface mm -hmm. for their units. Mm -hmm. So now you've got to take another 40% and put it on, and put it on structure based on this theory. Yeah. 
So, so he's mentioning um, that it's closer to another project we're working on where they take they take the whole site and you actually go under. So where you see surface parking, there's actually a garage and, or a parking structure underneath as well. So it's the whole plate of the development opportunity. So it's not just under the building itself. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges when you start looking at these sites is how can you how can you meet these requirements? Um, again, whether they're sh in phases or a longer term and. and um, one of the other par property owners in this area talked about how they are going to build parking and thinking about that to uh, take advantage of the future redevelopment of all their sites. So, um, so how is parking handled for vertical mixed use for other cities that have done this? So parking in structures, because so, again, park, the parking number of parking and, you know, is it happening in structures? Is it happening underground? Is what we're asking unreasonable? You know, those types of things. Yeah, so have you guys, uh, are you aware of the parking structure studies that were just completed as part of the moratorium? I believe that you might have been in that discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so from that analysis, and I wasn't the one um, leading that, but for what I understand is that our, uh, our ratios are right on for what they should be. And we did not. 50%, not at 90%. So ratios, I'm sorry, ratios of how many parking spaces are required. So are you asking okay. that or are you, ask, are you asking both? I thought you were asking both. Well, I'm asking more of the, how are other cities fitting in parking in vertical mixed use? Are they going under the entire site? Mm -hmm. um, are they, building some underground and some above the retail, mm -hmm. are they not requiring 90%? Yeah, they're not requiring 90% structure, but they also, um, so one of the things, the reasons that Crandall Rambula is recommending 90% is that if you don't, you're gonna get the surface parking, right? And so then you're gonna get that building form that's for all there for the next 20, 40, 50 years that has a big sea of parking and a nice pretty building. So we, we may have gotten that nice pretty building and getting that st commercial storefront, um, but we're not. We're going to have the sea of parking, and it doesn't create the, allow that pedestrian environment to continue to grow. So that's why they consider that this would be a higher percentage. I agree with the ninety percent idea. The problem I, I I have with is the reality of making that work in that area, uh, in this area that where this diagram is is labeled, partly because it has a very high water table. Mm -hmm. So if you go down a story or two stories, are you gonna keep all the water out? Two, what are you gonna do with all the cars if there's a flood? Um, and then three is with all that water in the ground, how is that gonna support a 10-story building? Because that's gonna be super saturated um, in the winter and the soils, are they really stable enough to support a 10-story building? If you start to do it structurally correct, yeah, yeah. It costs more. It's on piles. It's on piles. It costs more. Yeah, but. Mm -hmm. So, is there a plan for what to do with seven thousand cars, or in this case, let's say thirty-five hundred cars? Let's say it's fifty-fifty. Fifty percent is on the other side of, of ninety. Fifty percent is on this side. What are we going to do with thirty-five hundred cars if it floods? If it floods, you mean you're saying so all of them have structured parking and it floods? Well, if we have 90% parking and you're talking about going maybe two stories down or maybe one story up, we have thousands of cars that are gonna have to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a backup plan to people so their cars don't go underwater? Mm -hmm. No. Doesn't Atlas have a doesn't Atlas have a plan where they're downstairs in the parking structure, it's marked about the water? Yes. Yeah, so I think it happens site by site when it's developed. So the developers would address um, that as they, they, as they build. That's how they water table on that so there's, specific there's site. Different, so there's different issues with different parcels. So, so Atlas is part of, they're right next to the flood way, right? And so that property has historically flooded. That property, to my knowledge, hasn't flooded since I've been here. Now, the issue that you're bringing up, Ron, which is, okay, if you've got a, let's say you've got a piece of property that's not in a flood zone, right, and you wanna build subterranean parking which will intercept the groundwater. 
um, you as a developer need to figure out how to keep that dry and you need to also show that that impact to the groundwater and what it's trying to do isn't a problem hydrologically. So I mean, you've got both those things as a developer that you would have to solve if you're going down that far, which is why most of them probably won't go down farther than one story down, which means there'll probably be two stories of parking within the building. To answer Carl's question, generally I think what you're gonna see is ground floor, non-residential use, the next two floors or partial floors will be parking, and then the other use, whether it's office or residential, would be above that. Okay. Yeah, I don't anticipate or I don't believe we're gonna have above ground flooding in this area, but I could see if water level, I mean, we have wetlands, so I know the water table is almost at ground level. That's why I bring that up as far as flooding of parking. Mm -hmm. Sure, and then again, when, when that would be built, that I think you know, obviously we'd be very uh, on top of making sure they make the um, considerations that are necessary by code and being in the f um, that area. So. So I know things have been mitigated since the last flood, but there were two feet of water going right down Bill Gilman Boulevard for the whole way. So it has flooded. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes, we can never say never. Um, let me make sure. I, okay, so we did height. Uh, and then looking at, when we actually looked at, uh, if we wanted to see this actually happen, um, the calculations again, looking at the, what you could build with the current urban core FA, uh, FARs, uh, did not get us to what we wanted to see. And so these are the, uh, again, the calculations that are necessary in order to uh, align with the other recommendations. So we're increasing the minimum uh, FAR to 2.5, because currently it's, uh, po for commercial, 0.55. So they couldn't even build a two-story building, right? Um, unless you build it <laughs> really tall and skinny. Um, and then looking at the base, so again, that's in a weird word, but it's actually the maximum before you get into um, bonus density at 5.0, and the maximum at 8.0. And again, the height limits, you know, make sure that that all kind of takes account what, what we need. Not to uh, eat a dead horse here, but sure. um, I think it would be a good recommendation for the city to have a plan on how to deal with parking in the event of a flood. Oh, Developer, this is, this is, you could put that onus on the developer, but once they build and they're gone, that's it. So okay. then it's up to the homeowners association and man property management company, and they may not have all the answers. So okay. I think it would be prudent that we have a backup plan and say, hey, we take over the transit center, the top floors, that's gonna be dedicated for flood parking or we put them on Squawk, Intrum, or put them somewhere, but have a plan. Okay, okay. And so again, I mentioned, so this uh, again, doesn't allow the auto-dominated building type. So again, having that 0.55, uh, FAR then you know allows less um, less building space or and more more parking surface parking space and then the ninety percent um, so again this was a recommendation from the consultants looking at a, at what they felt was necessary to avoid building a building type that was going to be a sea a nice building with a sea of parking around it and that's what would be allowed uh, with fifty percent they did the analysis with our you know new standards because they're aware of those and it show that you're able to have you know a l large parking lot with your building and they felt if we're going to really in this area where we want to see that density and that pedestrian oriented less uh, more people walking on the sidewalks less uh, parking uh, uh, spots seen um, this is the way to go so was this recommendation separate from the the um, analysis that concluded that there wasn't the financial incentives, but there would be in the five to 10 years, because, it, yeah. so this is based on the structure, based yes. on what you want it to yes. look like, but not based on that we want people to um, feel financially secure doing this, which Fe is the You're other. saying financially feasible? Is that what yeah. you're Yeah, um, right. Right. Okay, because yeah. it, but they, right. they did so, do an analysis and they looked at what other other places they have um, they've worked in and showed that example. Um, so, 
Okay, but but, the, but we, there was the one analysis that showed that there is maybe not the economic yes. ec opportunity yes. right now, but in five years, and then this right. is separate. This is yes. just to get it to to have the form that we want. Correct. Okay. Yes. 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 Then the the remaining ten percent parking. Do you have a plan on what kind of parking that would be? Well, that would be allowed. So again, you ninety percent would be you know requires. They could do all hundred percent in a structure. But what the idea is that would probably be along the back edge of the buildings that would allow for the deliveries and other things that are necessary to have that access. So that would be controlled to delivery, ADA, loading and unloading. I, I don't know that I would say that at this de that level of detail because there could be um, you know customer parking, um, but but the idea is that the the number of, of spots would be able to fit. Um, in the back of the building and without, again, creating a sea of parking. And we would not have surface parking on the street or we would also have- surface. On street parking, yes, as part of the core streets uh, standards. And that would be that would be actually really important for a um, the commercial ground floor to have, be, have some spaces just like in, like in a downtown to feel like you can pull in right uh, off the street. And in looking at these plans uh, through this packet, I don't see anything about the green necklace or uh, bicycle paths. Right, so we, that wasn't part of their scope. Their, part of their scope was to look at if we were going to put regulations um, to create uh, a vertical mixed use building area, where would that be and what would those regulations be? So we didn't look at the broader things. Again, the Central Squad Plan has that. Uh, the Parks Department's doing a strategy right now, um, and I think it's probably near the end or finished, um, that also looks at partially at the green necklace. And so that, those, those work items were, are taking place in other, in other ways. Okay, so these would be um, submissive to the CIP, these developments. Additive, I guess. So submissive meaning this is. So if you're on, if you're in that map and you're that area, you have to follow these rules and what's in the CIP, Central Squad uh, Development Standards and Design Standards. I worry about things like bicycle paths getting cut out. Yeah. No. And pedestrian walkways when we have that many units yeah. being built. So yeah. those are very important. Yeah. And, and those would be there. It's just yes. we're not part of this conversation, but they will be there. Yes, and again, unfortunately, we're talking about this really tiny part of um, what we have for our vision for the community for the Central Sequoia area, but those things are still there. They're not being removed. They're not being changed, and so that's why we did. Tiny didn't. but important. What's that? Tiny but important. Yeah, yeah. Right. Every piece is right. So, um, so those are our again four recommendations of I don't know how many points the Central Sequoia standards addresses, but probably millions. But um, we will, again, we'll be back here um, for an actual public hearing on the 28th, um, then land and shore, and then full council for, adoption, for considering ad adoption. Are there any other comments, questions? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna come on a Sunday. Oh, oh. I wanna be done a day early. Okay, we'll go on the 16th. <laughs> That's been wrong now for two slides, two meetings, so sorry about that. Um, so do not come on a Sunday looking for this. We talked about a council. Yeah. So um, I, I recognize this is a really uh, complex topic, and we've been working on it for a while, and you guys are kind of coming in at the end chapter. Is there any other any information or any other kind of follow-up uh, you'd like us to do to, when we come back for the 28th to present back to you? I would like to see a more um, definite uh, uh, view of some of the other buildings in the other cities that have the same kind of uh, structures. Sure. To say that, yeah, they do it is one thing, but it would be nice to be able to sure actually see what is working, not just a, a piece of uh, a sentence that says, yes, it is working. It would, uh, real pictures, not views from that's designer sketches. drawing. Yes, drawing. yes, and in the small packet <laughs> pictures, those slides we sent you, we have some of that, but we'll, we'll add that to the slideshow next time. Okay. Yeah, because there are really some re really beautiful buildings and create some really great community. 
So one of the things that you've talked about here are basically four code changes, but I know in some of the earlier conversations we were talking about potentially incentivizing developers to do vertical mixed use. Mm -hmm. And one of the things discussed there was MFTEs. Mm -hmm. Are those off the table? Or are they part of a different discussion? That is part of a different discussion as part of our uh, affordable housing strategy. And we'll be actually um, going to council in November, and I think that one's the 14th, um, to talk at the work session to look at it for the transit-oriented development. But the council gave us direction when we came back from that first analysis that um, incentives were not the way to go. They wanted to make sure, they believe the market will eventually come, and they want to make sure that the regulations are there um, to, to ensure we get what we want um, as far that as building That was where forward. I was yep. going to, yep. so. Yep, yep, Okay. I do have a request. Yes. Um, so all the, so you have a bunch of recommendations and they were on different slides and you had different consultants and I'm harping on the consultant thing because I, that's what I do for a living. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so I would like to see you, you have, here's what the consultant that we, we brought in said, uh -huh. here's what, what the second one said, so okay. you said you had two, and uh -huh. then here's what the staff recommended, and I, I would like to see it as a, as a comparison, okay. to, to see what, what was changed. Oh, okay. uh, at, you know, just in a table form, the sure. three, three columns. Okay. Because I'm, you know, as I said, I'm concerned that it's the answer we're looking for is the answer we're looking for. And so that that worries me. So okay. I, I. Sure. And so you. just so you know, there may, between Eco Northwest and uh, Crandall or Ambula, the scopes were different. So it's not like it changed. So it may not be a reflective. This. We didn't ask the same questions, so they're not comparative like that. So we initially asked Eco Northwest, what is the market like? And then we asked Crandall Rambula about more specific, what do we need in, to uh, put in regulations for this building, per se? Um, so, so when you see, if you would see that on table, it wouldn't align as well. Yes. But the changes that you're you're, see, you're seeing here, we did rec we did reflect what we we uh, we as staff felt was changed, which is that one item. So I can do that. Right. Yeah. I, I just want to see all the things that have been sure. ha there's decisions made or dis or recommendations made by staff uh, that are different from what was recommended by the people we paid in to. You don't have to have so, all three yeah. columns filled up. Sure. But just maybe the two, the Crandall yeah. and Rambo. And then staff staff yeah. would be yeah. basically a, on all of them, but you could have. Sure. Yeah. Right. And and the last one was the uh, so what what Joan was talking about Joan right uh, about the um, the other cities and and what they're doing now yeah. I don't always always think that all cities are doing the right thing sure. or you know doing the the optimal thing but we'd like to see what that looks like sure. uh, with that recommendation. Sure. And so and you're talking more again more about the visual pictures or do you want to know about what they're rec yeah. Just a just a, a, a word comparison would be fine. Oh, as far as their their code, yeah. Okay. Yep. We have that, and that's we definitely have that already. So okay. Um, I would. I have a, another request. Um, I would like to know some information about the. So in between the two um, consultants, there's there's this 90% parking recommendation. The other one was taking into account the. Um, incentives versus disincentives and the economic um, feasibility. So I would, I would be curious to see the economic feasibility. Any information about that as far as taking into account this 90%? How much of a disincentive would that be to people considering or to developers considering the vertical mixed use? Yeah, if we ask that 90%, does it push the five to 10 years off to 10 to 15? Yeah, we don't have we don't have <laughs> yeah we don't have those contracts under or that that consultant under contract. So I'm gonna have to think about how to how we get that done because that was a, a really complex financial model that we don't have access to. So, um, you know, our our gut feeling could say, okay, yes, this is going to add more costs, and therefore it changes the financial feasibility and um, and I. 
when we sent the PowerPoints, were they as raw, or that was just like the four per slide? Because one of the things um, you can do, and I think, I'm not sure if in the memo it was linked to the different um, sessions, and we can send to you the actual PowerPoints, because you can actually see the data from Eco Northwest, which looks at how if you change parking ratios, if you change MFTE, if you change this, it kind of moved the line as far as feasibility. Um, so it can give you an idea without um, maybe giving an exact answer for the 90%. But um, you know, we know that the direction it goes when you require, have more requirements, it, it's becoming less financially feasible. Um, we did, you know, the one thing that kind of quote unquote uh, removed some disincentive. So instead, instead of saying um, 48 feet, um, you know, we said six. You know, we're we're looking at okay, what we you need to do it in six floors. That's what financially <coughs> feasible for that, and so that we believe is takes uh, as I won't call an incentive, but it takes away a disincentive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping that it may counter a bit, but it is true that um, it will cost more. Yeah. You, I'm gonna send those. you have a time range of when the city thinks something like this might come forward? Um, as far as a development to happen? Right. Um, we could guess, you know, the, uh, again, the, uh, the Commons is looking at talking to us about a development agreement to redevelop their property. Uh, I do not want to, I mean, it is one meeting of saying, this is what we could, if we are interested, this is what we're really, we really um, love your, your development and our vision for our community is this. And so there's nothing, you know, no time there. But I don't think it's going to be next year. But Which things could change. Which one's the Commons? Change. The Commons is where Target, and not including Target, oh, but um, Safeway and REI and Trader Joe's. So again, that's, they aren't looking at tearing down things and rebuilding. They would do it in phases as well. So um, the property owners of town and country have not shown an interest in redevelopment at this time, but things change as um, ownership cha you know, changes as in t over time. Um, and Chase Bank hasn't also shown any interest in redeveloping. What but we're talking about today could move over to the commons, or could include the commons. It is currently, yes. So the map itself, it it's kind of hard to tell, um, but this is the commons area here. Yeah, it's all combined. So the picture we showed was just of one space of that. So that, that could look like that all along there. Okay, and, but REI is not in that group. REI is below target. REI is Target is owned, owns its own property, right. and then this is the that building that goes around it. But in this room here, the two. Carl, did you have a question? Well, I can you go back to the height versus yeah. floor. Yes. Thing. That's the wrong way. If anything, I would like to try to see that. That's good for us. Simplified. Okay. I'm not sure how you're going to do this because at one point you're saying we're moving it from 48 feet to six floors. Then it's 125 feet to 10 floors, but the ground floor, we're talking feet. Yeah. So we're talking so, feet and floors. Th thank you, Carl. So we actually, we are going to actually have actually feet in the in the code. We wanted to keep it there because, again, that whole visual thing, what is what is six, what does 85 feet really mean? It's about six-story building. So we actually do plan to have, continue to be consistent with what is already there in feet. So thank you. <laughs> it seems like we're changing things yeah. Feet to floors and then back to floors or feet. Yeah. And I think it was more illustrative. Th thank you for, for reminding me about that. So. so the city has to have plans. I, I don't expect this development to happen anywhere in the near future, but when it does and mm -hmm. eventually something will happen, mm -hmm. um, you have to have these basic rules. And you have to have an idea of what you want the city to look like. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you don't get there? What If somebody comes in and, and wants to build almost to your specifications, but not really, is there processes in place? Or are you just going to say, no, would rather wait till the opportunity is there and the financial backing is there, or are you gonna let something else go in that kinda, but not really, if that's the question. So I, I don't know which of these items currently have administrative um, ability to, to adjust a bit, 
but um, but the idea is that this is what we want to see, and we, these are the regulations we're going to be on here, but we would work with the developer to see how we can get to the intent and um, get what we want, because otherwise, then we're end up building, again, something that not doesn't fit the vision. Well, I, I think so. that you should follow your dreams yeah. and say, this is what we want to look like, and if you can't build it to what we all agreed on, then Don't we're going to wait. It. I want you to wait instead of having that other. Okay. So this is how we ended up here. Um, so after Eco Northwest basically did their study and said, you're not, the market doesn't support vertical mixed use now. And if you want it now, you're going to have to put some incentives in place to get it. And the council said, no, we don't want to do that. And so then the question on the table was, what happens in the meantime until the market catches up to actually do this kind of project by itself? And the council was worried that they were going to get single story, surface park redevelopment, or things that didn't meet their vision. And they said, we want to mandate it. And if that pushes it an extra five years out, you know what, we'll wait, okay, we'll, we'll be perfect. good waiting. And so they made that decision, which is why we hired the second consultant to say, okay, if we want it, not if we almost want it, but if we want it, what do we have to do to get it? And that's how we got here. And, and I guess to answer your question, Joan, I would say that we have a very small subset of the 400 acres of the core that this is gonna to apply to. It's gonna be an overlay over an area. But if I don't want to build this, or the economics don't work out for my financing, I've got other properties in town I could choose from. Okay, that's, well that's, that's the hope. I mean, you actually answered the question earlier and said that council wanted to wait. And, and that's yeah, okay. kind of what I, I want the city to do. I don't want it to be haphazard, half, half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of, yeah. Compromise again. Yeah. So that these are rule. These are regulations. These aren't guidelines. <laughs> okay. Yep. Is there any other question? Any interest? Well, thank you very much for all your feedback. I know. Again, this is a. It's been a long t a process, and I, I appreciate every question. And we'll be back um, on the twenty eighth. Okay. So if I follow my agenda, there's opportunity if somebody wants to make a mm -hmm. comment on anything that was discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a public hearing as such, but we're certainly going to welcome Steve to come up and say something. Hi, Steve Pereira, living in Old Town for about 10 years now. Uh, so several thoughts. One was uh, the question of MFTE or other incentivization came up. Uh, I know I've heard the city council kind of give the idea that they're kind of against that idea. I would like to see you recommend that, put it in writing, that we don't recommend MFTE or other incentivization. Don't just rely on that. Put it in writing to provide that guidance. Uh, next point was, it seems something I've heard in the Highlands is they underestimated how many families with children would be living in apartment buildings. And because of that, they don't have enough school sites. Uh, I have. I would like to see more of a discussion with how this idea of mixed vertical use for, ha for housing would affect the school district and the number of the skill schools they build and where they build them. That part of the conversation hasn't happened. I'd like to see some recommendations from you all how that happens. Uh, I would also like to see recommendations on how uh, that's going to impact traffic and the flow of traffic and where the, all the traffic goes as part of that conversation, not just, and how these different pieces all fit and tie together doesn't seem to be something that I hear or see enough of. Um, my next point was, I have some concerns when we talk about a height variance between the number of floors and the number of the height of the building. When people see, let's say 125 or 135, feet, they expect 125 or 135 feet, or they don't see a variance, they want to know what they can expect, so I'm more concerned with having variables in there. I'm also concerned when we say things like the, the, the roof or the elevators don't count as part of that height restriction, so I would like to see this body say more about how that those things be included in the height restrictions. Um, I'd like to see a piece where we talk about where we talk about mixed vertical use, where it can go, I'd like to see some definitions or restrictions where it cannot go. Uh, for me, uh, 
Old Town is not susceptible or should not be susceptible to mixed road vertical use. I think the Gimlin Village properties where the small or houses make up the bulk of that are not susceptible to where it should go, but I would, again, not just where it can go, but where it should not go. Um, keep up the good work, thank you. So there was the map that had the green outline but you never said exactly what the green outline meant. And I saw that there was a pedestrian bridge going over I-90 uh, on the north side of Gilman Boulevard. And so, and Target is within that green line, but it doesn't have any of the black vertical mixed use nor the purple shading. So I didn't, I didn't understand the context of, of that. Um, so an explanation would be good. <sighs> okay. You know, when we had the Central Issaquah plan, 125 feet was hard fought and the community doesn't even like that. So now all of a sudden for the first meeting ever, I'm seeing 135 feet <coughs> with really no particularly good explanation as to why there's an extra 10 feet. I understand that you want a larger sort of lobby first floor, but I don't understand why that can't be uh, carved out of like in an interior um, uh, floor, like an atrium in the inside, right? So I would say keep it at 125. With HVAC, you can get a 15 extra feet. So we're still getting significant buildings, and I didn't hear persuasive argument that that was all that important. Um, so my bigger thing is interim changes. We have these big, huge, fat parcels owned by single landowners, and right now the code is written, you shall do the whole thing if you get above a certain percentage of improvement. And um, that's a barrier to change. So is it possible to allow these parcels to be broken into smaller units so that the landowners can begin creating the, a small portion, one at a time, of each building to the proper standard? Uh, because QFC Shopping Center is a bunch of small parcels. Town and Country is basically a big parcel in Chase Bank. So, um, they have to, de the whole thing has to develop if anything changes much at all, which I think is of concern. The next thing is when you're picturing it and we're picturing how we want our, our town to be, um, do we want them all to be built out at exactly the same time? Do we want these mega blocks of buildings that all look the same? Or would we like to have, oh, here's one building that was built with a slightly different architecture, and then there's the next one with, say, a zero setbacks. It looks a little different until you have a streetscape that's more varied instead of sort of, wow, that was that 19, I mean, 2022 uh, apartment style on three blocks. Isn't that charming? So. I prefer smaller units of varied architecture, and I don't see that being able to be done in this sort of large lot situation. I hope that made any sense whatsoever. Uh, then, because I know the ground very well in these areas, and I know where the critical areas and their buffers are, the maps that were created so far are so far off of the reality of what could be built as to n not even provide a, an appropriate template for someone to look at to understand the, the opportunities. So I think you need a little bit more ground proofing on you know not a huge amount, not actually what is in detail there, but enough to understand that you will you will really not be able to build eight feet from a wetland that has a hundred foot buffer, which is how the maps are being shown right now, right? So I think you need a little bit more ground proofing. And then uh, Steve said, all these puzzle pieces of all of these changes are all up in the air at the same time, and we're all trying to figure out how they're gonna come down and somehow form this elegant layered package that we're gonna be able to perceive as a great future for Issaquah. 
uh, we need all of that to come together in our brains too, to say, yeah, well, that one's over there and that one's over here and this one is over here and you are supposed to be deciding in a void how those are going to fit together. I, I don't think we're gonna have success. So I would ask that we spend some time trying to figure out how all the puzzle pieces are gonna fit together and if they actually will, because they might not. Thanks. Uh, F is first, and then you. Uh, Steve Crawford speaking as a Sammamish resident. You talked a lot about having nice, pretty buildings. I think it would be a shame to hide them behind on-street parking, and that is probably one of the ugliest things you can do in front of a building. So some surface parking behind might satisfy the need for retail. It's gonna be a bit of a challenge. Retail's gonna say we'd like to have parking right in front, but if you look around, there's a lot of other retail that doesn't have parking right in front. If you do have the on-street parking, then it shouldn't count as part of the required parking because it'll be occupied by residents all the time and it wouldn't be available for the people who wanna use it for retail. Hello, my name is Bob Swanson. I have no idea what I'm doing here in the sense of I'm still learning. I know what PPC now means. It's a planning policy commission, so I'm pretty proud of myself on that that I figured that one out. Um, you can tell me to sit down, I'd be more than happy to because I, I don't know if I'm, t um, I'm here to talk about the school up in the, the zoning. I don't know if this is the right time. I don't, I literally do not know. So is this later? Is this 8.30? Is this? It next will one. be the next, next one. Right, it's the yeah, next the next project. one will. Thank you. <laughs> and a little bit more time, and I'm sure Steve will be back to uh, tell us his thoughts on yeah. on additional school problems. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything? No, Mel. I, um, long time. I do agree with with Connie that it all has to come together. Um, I'm a little nervous that. Um, Every parcel, I mean, it, it, to build all these 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 gorgeous house, these gorgeous buildings, and uh, certainly not the way they look on that picture, because I thought, oh gee, we can't have those in Issaquah. We have to have some more creativity and and uh, design standards. Um, but I've never seen a map that basically says. This is the wetlands, this is what, where I can, how much I cannot build to, and this realistically is how much we can put in there. And I know that the, um, the people that you hired to do this work probably did some of that, but I don't think that every area in the city has, has done that. I know that we've talked about doing that three, four years ago when we were talking about the central area plan that, um, and I know the environmental uh, company that you hired to look at all the environmental uh, problems, uh, where we can put parking, how the traffic is gonna go. Oh yeah, the question, yes, you can build all the stuff that you want and the traffic will be fine. And somehow that does not compute. So um, I think besides putting all these buildings in, you have to look at where, not where they're parked, but how they get to where they're parked, and how many people are coming into town to work, not just to live there. And so before you come up with this grand plan, you have to look at all those things. I mean, I like most of the stuff of what you said tonight. Uh, I like the um, additions and the way of putting it together to make it clearer, but I still think it needs more to be a real plan. Just my thoughts. Anybody else? I actually would like to add on to that. Um, I would like to see what this would look like visually if it was built out to 90% of land potential. So if the land has the, I'm looking for, I'm thinking of the phrase, um, maximum use. I'd like to see what a plan would look like if these were, if this area was built out to 90% of its maximum best use and what the level of service would be um, along these corridors uh, if these buildings were built out to 90%. I'm not quite sure how you do that, but yeah. you have to, you have to um, 
somehow look at the traffic that, that, that these, this is going to cause. And I know that the people, um, the rest of the people who live in Issaquah, that's their main thing. You know, you, uh, what, you had an hour or so to get here tonight. I had problems coming down Front Street. You're going to put all these people in there. What do you do with them? And that's pretty far away from any of our uh, entrances on the freeway. So we're going to have traffic coming in. I mean, uh, Bellevue has a lot of access. Kirkland has a lot of different accesses to get to where they want to be. We don't. And I know this is a grand plan, and we want all this, all these people to come in and, and welcoming them and putting in real t retail that that will support them, but I think we just have to step back just a little bit and try to put it all together. And and I think that's a big part that, you know, you approve these plans and this is the way it's gonna be, but then what about traffic or what about this? And anyway, so with that, um, we're gonna, are you gonna present Trish, um, proposed um, comprehensive Chris plan amendment. We flipped. We flipped. I'm taking notes. Mm -hmm. I'm taking notes. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I will be here for a resource. Kristen will give us an update questions? on uh, proposed comprehensive plan amendments, and then we will open up to um, a public comments hearing. Okay. So for those. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> for those of you who I have not met, my name is Kristen Leeson. I'm with the Development Kristen, Service. I can't. Can you talk a little? I should take my Pull shoes off. off a little bit. There we go. So I'll do this again. For those of you I have not met, my name is Kristen Leeson. I'm with the Development Services Department. I work with Trish. As many of you know, we do annual comprehensive plan amendments. And this year, there are relatively few. They are primarily amendments that are required because of population changes or housing count changes, things that just need to be reflected in our comprehensive plan or acquisition of properties. So, uh, the, we only cover two elements this year. We're only talking about changes or amendments to the land use element and the transportation, or the transportation element, and also some rezones, which technically are in the land use code, but they happen simultaneously with some of our designations. The first one we're gonna talk about is the housing chart. This is a chart that council requested that, I'm missing something, um, that the council requested we add here um, last year. This reflects all of our, so as most of you know, we have state adopted housing targets for housing units. Uh, the the year spans or the horizon spans from 2006 until 2031. So by 2031, we are expected to accommodate, not build, accommodate 5,750 housing units within that time frame. So this just shows how close we're getting each year towards meeting or to how many units have been built towards that target. So as you can see in 2017, we actually built 1,116 units, which brought us up to 16,202 housing units. That leaves us uh, with about 1,292 units to be built until we reach that target. Any questions? The second update that we have is to the population projection housing unit and population chart. And we updated it this year that we submit information to the State Office of Financial Management in April and in June or July they get back to us with what our official population is for that year and the housing target. Um, we now have, we've adjusted it so we're at 36,030 people. And I forgot my sheet of paper, uh, 16,202 units. <laughs> That's what I forgot, thank you. Thank you. We also, in the past with the villages, have sort of had to guesstimate based on their allowed development, what they were going to build per year, but those development agreements are about to close out and we have a really good idea of what's gonna happen when those close out. So those numbers have been adjusted as well, which actually lowered the projections um, for the highlands a little bit. So 
So we are also, as you know, in the process of annexing the King County Island. This reflects, so this is our potential annexation map. And normally the King County Island would be right, I don't know, here somewhere, <laughs> there somewhere. Um, we are in the process of annexing that and they're assuming that the annexation will happen by the time that this goes through public hearing and then through city council. So this just reflects that that would no longer be a potential annexation area of the city. This also reflects that. We have two annexation history maps. One is the history of annexation since the inception of the city, and the other one is since 1990. This one is from the beginning. This also reflects up there, that little green dot. Also reflects the annexation of the Sammamish Utility District, which it was, oh. I mean, Bellevue. Bellevue. It's the Sammamish it Reservoir. It's the Sammamish, Sammamish Reservoir, Reservoir, Bellevue Utility District. And it was, it was a misunderstanding. We thought it was ours, it wasn't. And so we're just, it's a correction. And then the other one shows the King County property. Same here, this is just for the 1990, the, the annexation since 1990. This one, we, every year, the city acquires either through purchase or, design, or deed or Give to, uh, different ways we acquire properties. And when they are acquired, we zone, we give those land use designations of community facilities, which shows that it is a publicly owned property by a public agency, whether it be a fire department, a fire district, a police district, a city, um, the state, the county, and that it's going to be used for public purpose. So this is what we do. So seven out of the eight first properties are owned by the city and will be zoned community facilities. So the first four, these were acquired um, from Herschler as part of the 62nd Street development. They will all get environmental mitigation. Uh, property number five will get wetland mitigation and one through four will have riparian and flood plain, plain, plain improvements at a later date. This property was acquired with fire mitigation fees and it will be used for a fire station and other emergency services. And we are proposing that this one be zoned, uh, or be does it, they're all community facilities, the land use designations, those as well. This one is actually owned by the Overdale Homeowners Association, so it's privately owned. And they use it as a park. They would like to see it as preserved for open space for in perpetuity. And so what they did is they applied to the city and the state approved a deed which will keep it as open space forever. And so we are just proposing a redesignation and rezone of this property um, to, com I'm sorry, to comply with that. And it would be conservancy residential recreation, recreation. I'm sorry, would be the zoning. I've got a question for number seven. Sure. So with that, what you're saying is that's now public, would be owned no. by the city. This one is not. This one is privately owned, so the designation is actually conservancy. I apologize, I didn't mention that. The designation is conservancy, okay. and then the zoning would be conservancy recreation. All right, so the city would really have no jurisdiction over this except for the fact that um, it just falls within the city, but it's privately owned property and maintained by private. Correct. Okay. This one was purchased by the Parks Department and there are adjacent properties that were purchased previous years and eventually this will be redone into a park. So it's community facilities and then community facilities recreation is the proposed zone. So nine through 16 are part of the, these are all properties that are part of the King County annex, Island annexation. They are being, we're not proposing any zoning at this time. We are only proposing land use designations. The zoning <clears throat> would designate how many units can go there, what the density would be. This is not, this is an overall general use. The first two properties, nine and 10, are being proposed as commercial uses. And then 11 through 16 are being proposed as community facilities, land use designations. But what's the basis of the nine and 10 being commercial and rest being community There business. are 
there are proposed uses for those do, sites. Do you want me to? For, it's, and it's also topography. They can be used. <laughs> they're on they're on flatland. They're lower to the freeway or right. close to the freeway, and they're flatter and can be developed. Right. And yeah. number nine is a partial um, part of a property that has previously been annexed into the city long ago, and we, the annexer back then missed the tip of it, and the part that's already in the city is already zoned with commercial uses. Mm -hmm. The one, the other one, 10, is the site of the previous King County shop site, so there's already buildings and garages on that site, and so um, we thought that made sense to leave that with a commercial use, because there's already something there. Okay, thank you. And before you go to this one, I've got a, a quick question for number six, the 46 acres. Is that the location of BMC uh, back a couple pages? This one? No, to the north no. of that. Yeah, it's, BMC, B, yeah, like this is north of BMC. So you have BMC and then you have a Presbyterian church and then you have a house next little to house. it. The little tooth is the little house and then... Um, this, is BMC. this is BMC. Okay. That's the Presbyterian church or the church right there. Okay. And then these are residential in here, up to there. Okay, and so number six is going to be property for a uh, fire district? For fire, right. right, or for a fire station and then other emergency uses, but it hasn't been decided what those uses will be. Okay, thank you. You ready? Okay. So this is the only amendment to the transportation element. This is the uh, transportation improvement plan. This is the map for it. The entire document is much, much longer. You all saw this back in June, I believe, and made a recommendation to city council and city council approved that. So all we're doing is taking what's already been approved and updating it in the comprehensive plan to show what the improvements are proposed for 2018 through 2023. So, so the thing, uh, the properties 10 through 16. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. I asked Before if you were ready. Go, <laughs> you know, um, I want to get some, a little bit more information on that. Are they definitely the um, definite parcels or are they assumed that they're gonna be those parcels? So it's a good question. 10, 11, 12, and 14 are currently one parcel. And those lines are drawn based on elevations and slopes and where those are right now. So you're bringing them in as, you're not, you're not putting any zoning on them, you are doing what? Just land use designations. Right, your purview is the land use designation and usually council's done with the annexation when you get it because you already decided it was in a PAA. So you did the first step by putting all the land in a PAA back in 1995, and then council goes through the process when it gets annexed of doing pre-annexation zoning. Through the, They have two public hearings, 60 days apart, they notify everybody, and they figure out what the proper zoning is. Usually they're all done with that by the time we do the comp plan amendment that comes after. And so because they're not done, you all get to take a shot at the land uses instead of doing it as housekeeping because you've ar we've already gone through that. Um, they use the state process for the pre-annexation zoning and you use the um, your six, level six review to do the land use designation. So, what does um, that help? So, so to be clear on this one, so you guys are setting the land use vision for the island. What's, what you've got in front of you is the staff's recommendation. But you guys could say, you know what, I think all of that should be commercial. You know, that could be your recommendation to the council. You have the ability, I, I think what we can do is the conversation, the question you asked earlier, which is why, why, and why. There's a lot of background for why the staff is making the recommendation it is. So it sits, so 10 sits on the floor, and then once you start going up the hill, um, there's a significant ask from Mountains to Sound Greenway that all that stays forested. And so one of the reasons why we're recommending community facilities, and at the end of the day, it could be open space, it could be community facilities, facilities, but, but part of it is is the expectation that it will all be in public ownership. Right now, 16, 15, and 13 are owned by WashDOT, um, and then we own 10, 11, 12, 14. 
Um, and so part of why what's in front of you, there is a story here and we need to unpack that and you guys can decide whether you think that's, we landed in the right spot or whether you wanna make some other recommendation, but it's all about the land uses and not the zoning. The zoning happens at council as part of the pre-annexation discussion. This is about setting the vision for this area. And right now what we're saying is other than 10, which you can't really see from the freeway and has been previously been used as a King County roads maintenance yard, the rest of it should be community facilities. So that's, that's the recommendation that's coming from us, but you guys get to basically say whether you agree with that recommendation or whether you wanna recommend something else to the city council. So I know that there was a long discussion at the council on these particular uh, pieces of property and the process of getting them in, whether they're, which point in time, if you're looking at zoning, if you're looking at this. I know there was a, a big discussion on it and there was uh, some questions that needed to be answered and that's why I'm bringing that up. Was there a question in there, Joan? No. Okay. <laughs> now I wanted to know what, what the council had, why the council had a problem with putting it into co community facilities. Wasn't it the question between open space, community facilities, open space and community facilities, facilities? Right, so the debate wasn't about community facilities, it was about which community facility zone to apply to a portion of potentially 12. Okay, but we're not looking at zoning right, right now. Right, not at all. Okay. We're just doing vision. So what, so this this piece of property, you know, unfortunately we don't have, maybe we need to put up a, a land use map, um, but basically it's, you know, Highlands is immediately to the east of 12 and 14. Um, the freeway bounds the kind of the south and to the west, and then everything to the north of 10 is mobile home park, city maintenance yard. Um, it's kind of the small pocket that we have for manufacturing and industrial uses. And so th that's, that's why we see it the way we do. And 15 and 16 are, is really unbuildable because of the steep slopes. Uh, you know, nowadays, Ron, unbuildable's a tough uh, descriptor because there's a lot of things being chased by developers that have for decades been considered undevelopable. WashDOT, because they own it, um, they have expressed to us um, a, a kind of a, an interest to not sell it for development. So right now our water utility has been talking about potentially putting a reservoir on 13, um, but they would buy 13, 15, and 16, so all of the remnant wash dot parcels would, could likely become city parcels um, in the near future. Anything else? So the discussion of the school is potentially 12. Correct. Um, I'm just, just so, so, the, so the discussion of a school um, is not part of this conversation, mm -hmm. but could, will be coming back to the city council likely on 10-2. Wow. So you're asking us for a recommendation of what we think on, the vision should be for these parcels. On land use, not zoning. Okay. So basically whether we see it as community facilities or commercial? Or anything else. So or you anything. could So you could say, um, you know, it, that you might want it to be um, conservancy recreation. You might say that you think this should be um, residential. You know, maybe we want more housing. I mean, so that's the, that's the conversation we're having here, I think. Right, because the WashDOT properties right now are zoned residential in King County. Okay, so what is the difference then between community facilities and conservancy recreation? So community facilities is a, Trish, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> community facilities is, represents a publicly owned property by public jurisdiction. Conservancy residential and conservancy recreation are generally privately owned. Right. And so I that isn't even an thing. option for us. Yeah, there's no, something else. And the other thing with community facilities is it's for public use. Mm -hmm. It's publicly owned for public use. 
So I think what we're coming down to is everybody would be in agreement for community facilities. Yeah, and basically we're shoving the decision of whether it's open space or school or anything like that off to council to make the suggestion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are we making a motion for this? Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. So I make that way. Well, it's part of all. This is a public hearing. We're going to hear. It's part of all the amendments. Time. Okay. So, yes, that is the end of the amendments. After you didn't have any questions about the TIP, that covers the rest of it. Um, this goes back to Landon Shore on October second. I mean, sorry, goes. It does. It goes to Landon Shore on October fifth. It goes to Council on October second. Landon Shore on October fifth, and then back to City Council on October sixteenth for a decision. Yeah, should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So if uh, there's no questions from you, I'm going to open up the public hearing at 820. And if anybody would like to make any comments, this is just on the view. This is not the zoning, as, as we've been told 12 times already. But if you would like to comment, uh, absolutely. So once again, my name is uh, Robert Swanson. You can guide me any way you want. I have no idea what really a planning policy commission totally does. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Thank you very much. I think you guys are doing great. Um, I'm just gonna give you my opinion. You can stop me, tell me to sit down at any time. I live right about there. And so anyway, um, Beautiful hill right there. I know well, basically they want to put a school there. I heard about this a month and a half ago. I had to do some searching online. They got to be doing a meeting about this. I found out a meeting they were doing up at Cougar Ridge, I think it's called, the elementary school. And myself and only one other person came from our neighborhood because uh, nobody else knew about it. Um, so we went up there and they said, hey, it's great, all right. And so and everybody's for it. And I go, well, um, and so I had my chance and um, they let me speak and thank you. They. Uh, I said, well, it's very narrow streets. You cannot, I'm just gonna let you know, if, if you're gonna put anything public there, okay, school, whatever, where a lot of traffic's gonna be going through, you can't have people come down from above and go through here. Uh, one car can go this way, but not one car can go that way. It's a bunch of cars this way or a bunch of cars that way, nothing passing each other. You have to pull over, parking is terrible completely. You, if, uh, if you did put a school, you know how they say no left turn through between six and 10 or whatever it is, you'd have to put there and nobody could come down. So the next thing is coming down this way and there's the um, uh, hospital. hospital. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, and the hospital is right there. Okay, well now you got traffic coming uh, two times a day, five times, uh, five times a week, where the traffic is gonna have two, 300 cars, however many is gonna come dropping off. Uh, <clears throat> because nobody, every, nobody's going to let their kindergartner, first grade or second grade, walk down to a facility like that, whatever facility that may be. Um, <clears throat> so they're going to drop the kid off. Tons of cars are going to come through there. Uh, ambulance, we've had one gentleman get up there. Uh, Paul is his name. He lives right over there. He, has, it's, he had three aneurysms. If he had been, the doctor doesn't know why he's alive, um, but if he had been there a minute later, he probably would have been a vegetable. So uh, minutes are life-saving with ambulance. Um, the, I, I, at one time, too, we uh, had the bill pass, the bond pass, $100 million. So once again, I don't understand how all the money is spent and how we gather it, what we do with it. But from my very rookie understanding is we have $100 million to spend. Well, if day one, we would have gone, hey, up at 9th and High Street, there's a perfect place. It's in between there and up the hill where the movie theater and everybody, a whole bunch of the homes live up there. It's in between the two places. People can technically walk, probably not a kindergarten or first grade, but uh, they could walk up there. People can walk down. The apartments can walk over there. It's a great location. If from day one, they would have gone, hey, eminent domain, let's go for it. It may not have been done right about now, from what I understand. I, I didn't know everything about eminent domain. I know what it means, but the process, it does take a lot of time. There's lawsuits, there's multiple people that own land. But it would have probably been getting close to being done right about now. But now, for different reasons, I've been doing a lot of investigation, a lot of talking to people. I'm gonna try getting with people that own that land up there at 9th and 10th. I'm taking time off work next week. Um, and I know they've done a great, they've already met with them. But they had an opportunity. 
I don't want to go into great detail about things I've learned about it, but they had an opportunity at that point in time. Different reasons they decided to go with this one down here. Um, it, it really is a much, much, they got a three lane road. You can drop kids off, you can go right down the road. I know this isn't about school, but basically it is about a school when you get down to it. Um, so it's three lane road all the way done. They don't have to recreate, uh, do anything to the roads. They don't have to worry about a hospital. There's no um, bad con um, driving right there. There's, uh, you're not gonna cut down the tree. There's just so many pluses. The big, the big minus is money. I got that. If it's, uh, they wanna do five acres on this here, put five acres up at uh, Ninth and High, Ninth and High Street. Okay, let's say it costs you $4 million an acre. That's $20 million to buy that land. I don't know how much, I'm just throwing a number out. Um, yeah, it's gonna cost money, but you know what? It's gonna be a better deal all around up there at Ninth and High than it is down here. Congestion, travel, dropping people off, walking. Tons more kids are gonna be able to walk to that place than this place down here. This is like the farthest away place you can get into the Isqua Highlands in that area to get a kid to walk down to. Our neighborhood, obviously people can walk down almost any other neighborhood, no kid is gonna to walk to that. Just not gonna happen. Um, once again, I appreciate you guys listening. I don't know if I'm, this is the right time, the whole thing, but it, it um, I'm just like, if I was gonna have my choice, and we're gonna, I don't know if this is zoning, what you're gonna recommend. Uh, I know Issaquah, I just found out, is required to have more parks. I don't know if you guys are, work with that. I really don't know. But great place to put a park. All, my, um, all the people in the neighborhood up there, by the way, it's 92% uh, of the people are totally against it. Not, not a little bit, they are like, what? Cutting down a hill? Traffic coming through our neighborhood? Nobody can go this way? Everybody's gotta pull over, go through a driveway to let the other person go through? Uh, everybody's like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Put a park right there, put, tra put trails. People will love it. It's a great place. Now you can check off your park thing. Boom, done. Go put it up at Ninth and High. It's gonna cost money, I understand. I'm hoping for a miracle. I'm, I'm a person that I like, I like believing in the positive. It works for me, works for my family. So I'm, I'm really working on, on that. I'm doing my dil, di, uh, due diligence. I'm trying to learn about everything going on here. Uh, this is my fifth meeting in four weeks. Um, I have a ton more to learn. Um, Saturday, I'm trying to get with some people that are uh, members of city council just to find out what they do. I don't wanna tell them things because I hear I'm not supposed to influence people. So, um, but if I'm gonna make a recommendation, I don't know who I make that recommendation to, I think the city council and the, the board of directors need to, I mean the, uh, the board of education need to get together and go, hey, what do we need land? Let's do it, let's work together. I don't think they're really working together, that's my humble opinion. Um, so there you go. Um, Do I need to you. say anything else, or am I done? Or? No, you. Um, I appreciate some anybody who gets involved in the community who gets involved in, in looking at maybe other options for um, for the school. You know, we don't even know if the school's going to go in there. We don't know. know what's going to go in there, and if it does. They would have to do a, a huge trade study right. on on just exactly what you're what you're saying. So, um, I think that the city and the school district would um, be cognizant of the of the problems that it would cause to children walking in that area. So, thank you. But well, one thing that somebody mentioned to me last night, he goes, "Well, I, I I would get people involved once we start the planning stages," and I go. Well, that would be too late, because at that point, you've got everything going, now you're just planning the thing. That's why I'm getting involved here, because yes, I understand it's only pre-stages, but if you get to, if I don't get involved early enough. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, and there's two, uh, at least two people back there that you should talk to, yeah. uh, the president of the, the yeah. school Lisa's board. Lisa's awesome, and, I, I should, we've and already so, been. And um, so, those are the people that you need to talk to, yeah. to to find out that the city and the school district are indeed talking to one another and working together and have um, the last couple of schools that were built. So, so, so please get in touch with them and, 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 and see what, uh, what can ha happen. Is there anybody else that wants to make a comment? <laughs> uh, so you can leave this map up here, but the fire station land 
we talked a lot about prior zoning for this one, but I didn't know what the prior zoning for the fire station land was. And um, while we talked about the future process for this, we didn't talk about what the future process is for the, uh, the planning of a fire station there because most of that land is critical area. There's only a small part of that land that is not. And so um, while this has been cut into theoretic chunks, the other one is just one big parcel. And, and, and so I, I sort of want to know what the next steps are for that. But we can take it offline. I just wanted to show the difference. Now, one, I don't know what footnote one and two are or what they mean because there's no footnote thing here that I can see. Am I missing it? Uh, they're in the they're in the slide notes. Okay. Um, uh, the one of them is that the um, that there's not actual property lines there, and the uh, acreage is um, approximate because we don't actually know where the property lines are going to be between 10, 11, and 12, and 14. Uh huh. Um, that's, that's that's footnote one. Oh, it, no, that's, no, that's footnote, footnote two. two. And footnote one is that that's only partly part of right. the Burgess property. That's already the other part is already in the city. We don't know footnote the in it. We don't know. And that's yeah. only 0.07 of it is in the King County Island. So, and this is this is actually where City Council got wound around an axle, and I'm I'm going to wind up around the same axle because. If it's only approximate, how can we put it into official parcels if we don't really know what the parcels are? Right. So right. my problem, as much as I really actually would like to put 10, is it 10, which is the one I want, 10 as commercial, I don't know what 10 is. So I would say you would have to put the, the use the same as all of the rest of the parcel numbers that are in that group because it's all one parcel. We actually don't have more than one parcel to designate a use on. Right, and just to answer your question, we've done that in several places in the past where there's a slope or the, um, uh, both on the Grand Ridge where the Spar Road is and also on the Spock property where we've zoned knowing that the top would be one thing, the bottom would be one thing, but not knowing where that middle line is yet until a property site plan comes in and then we decide how to put the buffer on, do you put it at the top of the slope or at the toe? So we've we've done that before, where the, there's been an asterisk on the zoning map that says this line will. Well, this is come the true. land land use, right? It's not a zone, right? But uh, to me, right, why would same. you why? I, this is just my comment. You don't have to. Right. I just ask, wanted to let you know that we've done back. this in the past, and that could be, but it doesn't seem right. No matter how many times we've done it in the past, it seems like if you're designating an official thing on a parcel, you should actually be able to describe the parcel that it's on officially. And, and um, or you could potentially show the contract by which you are deciding exactly how you are going to decide you're going to resolve that parcel. Because right here, it's more of a trust us situation. We have it in hand, but we don't know. And they're trying to make a decision for the community that is responsible. And so that would be my, my comment there. I think that's it. Oh yeah, we got it, thank you. And actually, that, so that's a very, uh, that, that point is valid. It's also got the same parcel number, and I was wondering about that. Uh, but so this is now commercial, uh, and considering the concerns with the school, um, you know, if, if this goes to commercial, so 10 goes to commercial, then does it eliminate the option to make it the school? And that's a different place, right? Right. The no, ten, right. Ten is the uh, the previous King County shop site is where what ten is right, right. now. Right. Okay. So we're gonna finish the um, public comment. So. Um, so I guess a couple thoughts. One was. Uh, 
maybe CF to me seems a little overly used in Issaquah. Can we come up with some additional uses for for things like a school zone specifically, or can we look at a uh, zoning was not, I know we're not doing zoning. Uh, a conservancy could apply to public land as well as privately owned land, uh, and maybe that would be a better use for some or all of these properties. Um, to me, I, when I've seen things come, uh, another thought was when I've seen things come to development commission, it's what does the code allow them to do? What does the zoning allow them to do? So you might change and move things around a little bit, but basically if the code allows it, you can build to whatever that code says. Uh, so I tend to think more of having zoning that allows that to happen so that you make that happen or don't allow that to happen based on the code because you can't say we don't want to build in the steep slope area if the code allows it to happen it's going to happen so more towards concern for how maybe a top spot of the an area affects the bottom slope or steep slope areas needs to be con con determined in conjunction with each other, not as separate pieces. Uh, that kind of alludes to the point that Connie made earlier. Um, thank you. Does anybody else want to make a public comment? Steve Crawford, Director of Capital Projects for the Swiss School District. I think as we look at land use designation, the King County Road Shops area at the bottom of the hill has been commercial use for a long, long period of time. It makes sense for that to continue in that sort of designation. And while 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 have different lines in between them, 11, 12, 13, or 11, 12 and 14 are all part of this King County parcel. And as proposed, that's all just CF. So you're really only looking really at uh, the industrial commercial area at the bottom and the rest of it is all CF to be further designated in a zoning decision by council at a future time. Anybody else? Hello, I'm Lisa Callen with the Issaquah School District School Board. And um, so I just wanted to say on behalf of the school district, the school board, that we are in favor of the land use of CF community facilities um, for the King County Island parcels 11, 12, 14. Or specifically, we're interested, we have a high interest due to our bond that we passed in 2016. Um, part of that bond was to build two elementary schools, one middle school and one high school. So we've done extensive land searches for suitable land that would be, um, on the initial uh, the initial checkbox list of what would be suitable for the district to try to do a deeper dive um, for these four sites of schools. And we have a high interest in um, the upper portion of this King Island area. And uh, of course that would fall under a community facility because it would be for public use. And so that's, um, that's our perspective on it and we wanted to share that in terms of um, why we're here tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a comment? Seeing nobody else that is uh, wanting to make a comment, I'm going to close the public hearing at 8.36 or about and open it up to you guys for your questions and um, on any of these parcels. So I've got one. Trish, you mentioned that the washed out um, parcels are currently so uh, designated, zoned. you said, zoned for residential. Mm -hmm. So do they have any opinion on changing the designation to community facilities? Right, they're aware that we're down zoning and down designating them. And as Keith said, it's partly due to, because they know that we're thinking about the water reservoir being mm -hmm. there and we're thinking about trying to purchase. But that doesn't change anything that they're currently doing on Correct. the site or any plans that Correct. they Correct, yeah, they're all vacant now. Okay. So in regards to the boundary between 10 and 
11 and 12, because it's not technically a boundary yet, you're asking us to approve this in the spirit of the map as pictured. Correct. So you are um, putting in the boundary between 10, 11, and whatever that is, um, because of the, the way the land is. The geography. That's why you have created those. Does it make a difference if, if we would sort of put it all into community, except the commercial, into community facilities, and then when you get to a point where, well, you might change the, the line. No, and you know, yeah, it's for, for this purpose, for this discussion, we should have taken out the, the lines between 11, 12, and 14. Yeah, because it, you are right, they, the proposal, the vision for those is that they will all be community facilities, and the vision for 10, makes sense that it would be commercial. That's what it's been. It's next to the road. It's next to commercial and intensive uses now. And that would be the vision. So yes, you would look at 11, 12, and 14 as one piece. And then at a later date, could look at those as separate parcels. Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't make any difference. Well, it wouldn't make sense to make, to grow 10 as a commercial piece and absorb 11 because you have such a steep slope there. Right, Correct. exactly. Yeah. Okay, and so that's why it's kind of a zigzag, but we just haven't got to the point of actually making physical boundaries. Correct, correct. We're using, okay, understood. So are you gonna go out there and draw a line? How are you gonna, how are you actually going to um, draw that line? So it's been surveyed. So we, we've already had a surveyor go out and survey the property. So what's happened is that pad that King County created at the bottom for their road maintenance, they actually cut the toe of the slope and used ecology blocks to um, create bins for them to store like sand and gravel and stuff. And so that line generally follows the back of their property that they cut. So we know where it is. Uh, we've got a surveyor that's doing a short plat to actually create that parcel as a legal parcel separate from the balance of the, the property that we own. Because our intent is to potentially um, get rid of that property. You're talking about 10, getting rid of Correct. 10. Correct. Yes. And once once that plat is recorded, then that goes in here, and we, we know exactly where the line is. And so 10 being commercial, what would be, uh, if someone was to come in and actually buy 10 and build it out to maximum use, what would that look like, potentially? Those, those include, you're gonna... So, um, so did we do a transit-oriented development presentation to you guys? No. We should. Then you'll know what we're doing with 10. That would be <laughs> um, fun. So uh, if you guys have an open agenda slot and want a presentation on a transit-oriented development project that economic development is working on right now, uh, it includes that parcel. So it's part of a story um, that is much more complicated than we might want to get into tonight. Generally, though, commercial includes intensive, intensive commercial, which would, um, and retail, I believe, but incl it includes low intensive uh, manufacturing uses, um, light industrial, that's, that's what I'm looking for, light industrial uses, warehouse kind of uses that goes in there generally. Okay, so um, I know that there was some questions at the council because the lines are not Parcels are not uh, created yet. Not separate. Surveyed and, and right. actually made. Those are just your uh, estimations of where they're going to be. Right. And with that, I don't know if it's easier just to zone the whole area and and not put it into um, parcels that you've created. And is there a problem with doing that and then later on when you're actually looking at, uh, when the council goes in and looks at zoning to actually say, yes, these are the par parcels at this point in time? We do not want yeah. them to yeah. predispose the 
the designation on the map of 11, 12, and 14. So no, uh, we do. <laughs> it's all so. The, just <laughs> so um, so the idea here that's coming forth, what this looks like, CF and commercial. That's all we're asking you guys to. Okay, so you're not about. you're not it's, looking it's, at. Okay, that's. It's not it's not deeper than that. It's we're, and the reason is so. Here's our vision: is ten is flat and historically been used as a commercial property, and the rest of it's forested. Okay. And it's publicly owned. So for us, because it's publicly owned and it's forested, it would be community facilities. Okay, I don't have a pro I don't have a problem with community facilities. I think you know that's a a fine designation. I just don't want to see any problems with the actual lines. If we're just going no, because because you actually have divided it in the way you have put it up there. Mm -hmm. So if you get rid of that. And just say okay. commercial facilities, then I'm fine with that. Does anybody have any, any well, other? As far as 10 goes, shouldn't we actually understand what that would look like as commercial before we vote on it being commercial? Because right now they're asking us to take basically a virgin piece of land and add it's a, a high level it's code it's to it. It's, it's not an a existing piece of garage land. and um, building and garage and office right now. That's what 10 is. It's already been cleared. It's already mm -hmm. has been used in the past for a King County roads maintenance site with the right. bins for gravel, sand, all that kind of stuff. It's it's an industrial place right now. Right, but I, if I'm not mistaken, what I just heard was we like to zone it as commercial and then sell it. Is that what I'm hearing? We're designating well, it. <laughs> so, um, so the council gets to make decisions on the sale of land. So right now, city staff are working on a project that includes that parcel. And right now, all we're doing is making a designation for what the land use should be there. And if there's reasons why you don't think commercial is the right designation, then you should propose an alternative designation. The rest of that tale and story is really not part of this conversation. Okay. It's, a, it's for a later date. You don't. Well, I don't know what that commercial. I don't so know what the all the land use ten. So you're asking us to make a decision on something that we haven't been filled in with. So all the land use that's adjacent to ten, yep. on the on the on the, comp, on the comp plan map, and maybe we need to put the comp plan map on so you guys can see the context. It's all commercial. So everything that's kind of north of there. That's our that's commercial, and if we need to put the comp plan map up, we can because I think so. The zoning map behind you is is a different. It's got a finer grain of detail, but the comprehensive plan map, which is where this will this right now, it shows up as white on the comp plan. Um, what we're talking about is putting colors in to the comp plan for the island. That's all we're talking about here. So, so let me ask you this, Kate. So that is, in a, that is not, those are not separate parcels, right? They all have the same parcel number. Uh, they're not separate parcels. So right now that's an approximate, it's some piece of that, that total land, right? It's five acres up there. So what's, so it, I'm playing devil's advocate here. What's to stop anybody to say, from saying, now five acres is now 10 acres, we're gonna, we're gonna take down all of that wooded area and make it all commercial. Because originally it was approximately five and then we decided we're gonna make it larger. It, 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 so we are having trouble with, with something that is not defined. So 10, right? is, de 10 is defined. The, the story, the, the conversation that happened at the city council, because I was there, was not about 10, because 10, we know the dimensions of 10. It was about whether or not there was a CFF parcel at the top of the hill and what the dimensions of that were. And because some of the other variables have not landed on that yet, we didn't have the exact dimensions for what a potential school site would look like. And so that's what happened at the city council. It wasn't about 10, it was about what's showing up as 12 on this map. Um, the dimensions of that parcel are not set as of today. We have pictures of what that area looks like. Ten. We could pull up pictures if that would be helpful. It's on it IMAP. Be. The picture of the shop site is on IMAP. 
And just so you know, the, the existing parcel is zoned mining in King County, and um, we didn't want to be comparable and, and zone at that. Why not? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. Okay, so here is our King County Island. And so you can see basically, so what showed, oh, that map's gone. So what showed up is 10, 11, 12, and 14. So that's this parcel. You can see the parcel boundaries right here. So the city of Issaquah owns this parcel, which you can see right here, this is down at the bottom of the hill. So elevationally, this is at the bottom, this is slope up to the top, it crests about right here. So there, there's a crest line that runs along this line. And then this wooded area is up at the elevation of Issaquah Highlands and Swedish and the subdivision that's going in right next to it. Um, so the area that we're talking about being commercial, you can see there's a very distinct eastern edge to it um, because that actually, if you had, if I'm going to guess that Google Street View didn't come back into here um, because it's not a real street. Uh, but if you saw that, there's actually ecology blocks that form this back edge. And as Ron mentioned earlier, what happened is they basically created a flat pad they cut the toe of the slope, there's ecology blocks that are stacked there, and then it goes up the hill from there. And so migrating that eastern property boundary any farther east is really expensive because then you're actually having to cut more of the toe of the slope and build a retaining wall to hold back the slope. Don't forget, all of this is owned by the city, so any property decisions about taking a bigger parcel, migrating that, taking down the forested hillside is a decision that the city council would have to make. And as I mentioned earlier, and even though, as Trish mentioned, these parcels, this one here, and this one here, and this one here are owned by WashDOT, you know, both WashDOT and the city of Issaquah um, support Mountains to Sound Greenway. And part of the vision for Mountains to Sound is that this hillside um, remains forested. And so that's one of the reasons why I think to answer the question earlier, I'm not sure WashDOT's concerned about us designating this as community facilities because them selling it for residential is probably not in the cards politically. Um, and it helps that we're looking to potentially site a reservoir somewhere back in here. So I don't know if that's helpful, um, but that's part of the story. So one of the, my concerns is that as far as commercial, if we zone it as commercial, the You're not zoning has, it, you're putting a designation for land use. No, I'm sorry, we're yeah. giving it a designation as, as commercial. If we do that, then the city would be its desire may be to sell it, but wouldn't that be prime property for the city to use for facilities? We could do that still. Um, so just because you put a commercial facility on it, so I'm gonna pull the map down a bit. And so right here, this is the city's public works operations department. Um, so we, we have facilities in this location, maintenance facilities. And we actually own the, um, uh, the trailer park. So we own this parcel too. Um, so, you know, this piece of property though, like I said, right now, right now we've got plans for it. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll actually get that over the goal line. So if at the end of the day, um, we, own this um, and don't have a use for it. Uh, we could use it for like a parks maintenance shop because we are trying to move the parks maintenance shop out of Confluence Park. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to do 
that we could use this property for, and at the end of the day, um, if the council were to decide a different zone, so let's assume that you guys make a recommendation that it all should be community facilities, or let's assume you make a rec you go with staff and make the recommendation that that should be commercial. City council still will zone the property, and if they choose to put a different zone on that property, then we come back in next year's comp plan docket. Well, actually, we could do it this year because we'll know the answer to that answer. potentially in a couple weeks. Um, but I, I think, um, I guess what I would say, Ron, is um, I think what we're looking for is for you guys to tell us what you think makes the most sense here, um, and then we'll take that forward as a recommendation to the city council from PPC. Okay. So if, if, what the, if what the staff, if what the administration is recommending, at least for parcel 10, doesn't make sense for you, then pitch a different alternative and you guys can deliberate on that. We're not, there's, there's multiple choices here. So if we decided as a, as a body to say, we'll go with CF, CF for the entire parcel, for all lots, ex expected lots, then the city could come back with a proposal and say, this is what we want to rezone. We want to zone lot 10 as a commercial piece, and this is why, dot, 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 and then we could make the decision, and then I can go to city council, and then you actually make the decision to zone it. So they would make both a decision for zoning and for land use. So what will happen is, so the administration makes a recommendation, you guys make a recommendation, it's great if they match, if they don't match, then the staff will provide a rationale for why the two recommendations didn't match, and then the council makes a decision based on that. Okay. I don't see this as controversial at all. Uh, I think it completely makes sense to list that as commercial considering the surroundings and the landscape of that and the rest as community facilities and take that decision off of city council since they're gonna have enough on their hands in deciding what will potentially be parcel 12. Well, we're not taking it off their, their plate. They still have to, to look at it, but they can look at it as our recommendation. Um, we do have to um, make a proposal uh, for this. Uh, so keep that in your mind. Sorry, I've got a quick question for Keith. Yes, um, I can listen. The parcels that are in front of 10, like the, the trailer park and the other facilities park. Uh, like these, yes. You're right, those are commercial? Or no. what are those CF? They're CF. F. They're CF because we own them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess the next step is to make a motion. And we'd like to make a motion that the um, King County Island is zoned as CF. We're not zoned for CF, but it's designated as CF. That's, that's 10, right? That includes 10. No, includes then if you know they wanna uh, come back and make it as commercial, then it could be a, a discussion when they have a, a proposal that's fully baked. Do I get a second then? Somebody has to second it. Okay. No, it's been moved and seconded. And is there any discussion for zone of zoning for uh, designating all of those areas? I have a question for Keith. What does that do to that particular part parcel? Does it make uh, it? It's still CF. It's zoned, it's zoned. So, um, so you guys don't have the, um, you guys don't have the benefit of understanding what we're doing with that parcel, and I apologize for that. At some point, we brought you guys so much stuff, we, you guys should ask, ask. So I'm, I'm giving you the invitation to ask to get the presentation on transit-oriented development. So the city council's already entered into a memorandum of understanding with a developer to basically move the CenturyLink maintenance yard from where it is next to the Sound Transit garage um, on SR 900 to this location. In, uh. in exchange for that, so there'll be, so we will build, a developer will build a one-story maintenance yard for CenturyLink because they do not want to leave the city in this location. In their current location, and I can, since I have an aerial photograph up, I can go there. 
I can, might need to scroll down a little bit. Um, I think I can get there. No. Keep going. Get to north. Okay, wait, I found the park. I'm doing good. All right, so this is where CenturyLink is right now. Um, this is Newport, this is SR900, and this is the park and ride garage. Um, our plan, our very complicated plan, is to move this over to that bottom piece of property and then in exchange for the developer building them a new one of these over there, they will then get access to this piece of property. And what they are going to build here is some of that stuff that Jen talked about early. Um, we're gonna get, uh, it's a 300, I'm doing this from memory, so I apologize. It's like 360 housing units of which at least half of them are affordable. It's got a human service space in the ground floor. It's got ground floor retail. It's got two floors of parking above that ground floor. It's got one p level of parking uh, that's subterranean, um, and it's got a big kind of plaza space that's across the street from the new skate park um, in Tibbetts. Really cool, council super excited about it, um, but we need the bottom of that property to um, potentially uh, be part of a three-party transaction where that would go to CenturyLink um, at the end of the process to replace this facility here. So my apologies for that. So if you guys do co community facilities for all of that, given the fact that the city council already approved memorandums of understanding to work with both CenturyLink and the developer, uh, my guess is the council will ignore that and probably put commercial on that. I think that Lower was piece. my question. If it I got is, there eventually. Yes, if it, if it is CF, then the city, I mean, you, you, still, you can't put commercial into it. Um, so there is a restriction of what you can do with it. You can't add the, put the commercial in it. So I wanted that to be clear. You know, the rest of it, you can eventually put whatever you want. So likely, and we're in a kind of a funky procedural thing in that there's kind of a recommendation that's in process on the entire comp plan docket. And in the midst of all that, the council's gonna make a decision on one of the things that you guys are making a recommendation on. And if ultimately you make a recommendation and they don't uh, concur with it 100%, my guess is it would come back here and we would change the recommendation ultimately coming forward. I don't know, it seems a little, we got a weird procedural thing going on, but we'd figure it out. But this isn't, f I mean, I understand, aspirationally we're going this direction and, and everybody's on the same boat. Uh, if this, there is a chance that this could fall through. Sure. sure. So could we, in, in, in essence, make a motion that we zone everything as CF and if CenturyLink deal goes through, it becomes commercial? This, it's my understanding the CenturyLink deal can't go through and CenturyLink is kind of holding back on that next step until they know that the city is behind this part of it, right? So um, so it's, a, it's complicated. So um, <laughs> there's, to make it even more complicated, um, enters King County and King County has set aside um, $10 million for Issaquah, North Bend and Snoqualmie specifically for transit oriented development. And because uh, Snoqualmie and North Bend likely don't have the facilities to qualify for that $10 million, it could very well be that the city has the ability to get $10 million from King County from their transit-oriented development funds to apply specifically for this project. All the pieces need to be in play and moving in the right direction for us to get King County's support for making that allocation. That application is going in this month. So, so the, the $10 million piece is for CenturyLink going to parcel 10 and the CenturyLink uh, area becoming that affordable housing piece. Yes. Okay. It helps with the financing. Back to the conversation earlier about the market's not here. Outside financing, if you can get $10 million from a third party, that uh, makes a big difference. So with that understanding, 
I like a plan A, plan B kind of thing, but I mean, I understand yeah, exactly. that. And it's like, okay, we like to go forward. So with we're going to move. We're going to move this forward. So understanding what uh, Keith has just explained, do you still want to go forward with your motion, or do you want to pull your? I would like to retract that motion. Is that uh, approved by the person who seconded it? I, I'm, I'm concerned that, that by the way these conversations go, it's, you know, we don't want to approve it, and so then there's a whole bunch of other information that wasn't provided to begin with. I mean, this is... The, the motion has been... Withdrawn. Fine, you know. Okay, so um, if the, I assume if the motion, if the maker of the motion has pulled it back, I'm assuming that... Um, the second goes away, right? That's right. Okay. So, would you like to make a new motion, or anybody like to make we, a new motion? Can I ask a question? We're, if I'm not mistaken, we're not approving anything. You're recommending. We're we recommending. are making a recommendation. Yes. yes. Right. So we can recommend to the city council that it be all community facilities. That meets everybody's desire. The way I see the issue. And then with the city council having the greater knowledge of the inner workings and hidden mechanisms of under the table deals that are currently machinating out over here, which we have no knowledge of, they can change it and they can make it commercial. That's one way that would solve the same scenario. I was gonna suggest that we that solves the problem. I'm very much in favor of this being designated as commercial, so I will go ahead and make a motion that parcel 10 be designated as commercial and the remainder as community facilities. Do I have a second? Thank you. Mm. And I missed, I missed the whole I motion. Make it, I can't second it. What was that? I missed the motion. Yeah. We were having a we trouble. I made a motion that parcel 10 as commercial and the remainder as community facilities. Okay. And now Joan is asking whether or not she can I second. Mean, can I second it? I don't think I, I can. I think the chair and alternates can't do motions or oh. vote if there's already a, um, if there's already a quorum of, of official, of what do we call them? Regular members. Okay. Can the alternates do second? Can the alternates make a second? Or no? mm -hmm. We have four. Second. Okay. And the motion fails. <sighs> so, we have awesome. another motion. How do you want to proceed? Question for Carl. If we, what do you think of proposing it to be CFF, or I'm sorry, CF, and if this deal with CenturyLink goes through, uh, it goes to commercial or parcel 10. I, I, I think that's unnecessary. It's, it's, because the council if, would, if the council is, council will change it. I hear you. To do that if the deal is contingent on it being commercial. But we don't know that because we don't know all the details of what's going on. And since there's concerns over a specific piece of property in regards to the dimensions and exactly what's going to happen, we eliminate that by just saying we'll do the whole island, uh, community facilities, and then if the city council deems it necessary to have a specific portion, nine and ten, maybe make ten a little bigger or something for whatever reason because of the machinations going on in the back room, smoke filled. Okay, I make, it. I make a motion that uh, the King County Island is designated as CF. And I second it. And the rest? Are you just gonna, are you just doing parcel 10 or are you doing all of it? All of it. King County Island. what you said, so. King County yes. Island. Uh, what, one of these parcels, parcel nine, yeah, nine is actually yeah. privately owned. Right. It, it can't be community commercial. facilities. Right, nine is the little part that's just part of a parcel. 
Yes. Then you couldn't, so that couldn't be designated community facilities because it's not publicly owned. The teeny little 0.07th of an acre. But that's not part of the King County Island. It, it is. is. It is? Okay. It so was an part of the King County so just, Island just PAA. Call out the, the parcel number. Right. And that's nine. Right. So, so you would want. Use the parcel I number. I make a motion then to designate the King okay. King County Island as CF with an exception of parcel nine. Perfect. And a second? Okay. okay. And the second? And I second, I second. Okay, so any other discussion? With that, all those in favor of the motion as stated, Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Who was a no? I put Lindsay. my head down. Lindsay's no. So there's three, four. I vote aye. Three Sorry. in favor. Uh -huh. three. And three. three in favor, one against. Yes. Okay, one so that's Carl, Ron, and Joan. So with that, uh, if there's no other. Wait, you have an entire list of comp plan amendments that still amendments. need to be recommended to the oh, city council. That was just the non-controversial amendments. Oh, okay. <laughs> we just got rid of the hard part. Yeah, so it's just okay, going to get so that. I need so a, it's, it's a the motion to accept the uh, amendments as stated by Kristen in, in relation to uh, housing and. I make a motion to uh, to approve the uh, the amendments to the comprehensive plan and zoning map for the 2016 docket, including land use amendments, redesignation, rezoning community facilities, redesignation, rezoning the Overdale property, and a transportation element six year transportation improvement program and related map. I second. With the exception of the but isn't, <laughs> isn't that part of Correct. So with right. the exception of uh, with the exception as right. as was stated. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Brilliant. Motion carries. <laughs> well done. So with that, with that I'm gonna call the meeting to close. Okay. At agree. ten after nine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. We just said it.